Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is a continuation of the Board of Selectmen meeting for Tuesday, May 9, 2017. We began our meeting in executive session to discuss contract negotiations, litigation, and real property. Next up will be the Pledge of Allegiance, please. There's a flag straight ahead. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, Indivisible, indivisible, with liberty and justice, justice for, all. for all. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> next up will be item two on the agenda, which is the public forum. We have several individuals interested in presenting some thoughts to the board tonight, as I'm aware, and maybe others are here too. So why don't we begin public forum? We'll go with um, uh, Dottie Ferret or Wallace first only because we want to show kind of how it works. Do you know what I mean? So, Dottie, if you would be the, uh, the puppet. first <laughs> to join us for public forum, we would appreciate it. With the puppet. <clears throat> and while Dottie's making her way here, uh, just a quick FYI for everybody, including those that may be watching at home. Uh, we have a hard stop at 9.30 this evening because of some uh, needs for the schools to reset the library for tomorrow morning. So uh, we're going to have to really try to be focused as much as we can tonight to get through items in, in the timeline uh, set up uh, or we're going to run over. Mrs. Farrad or Wallace. As we look to the close the books on this year's marathon and look forward to our celebration of another successful start, I want to share my deep appreciation and thanks to the BAA for one more, one of the most exciting starts here in Hopkinton. BAA race director Dave McGilley orchestrated another unbelievable race along with the many BAA star team captains, 950 volunteers, and 30,000 plus participants. I get emotional thinking of all the people who work together for the one common cause so that runners of all levels can, can represent all the good that this race has to offer. I often say it's all about the people who make the Boston Marathon what it is just to look to all the smiles on everyone's faces. So many special ma moments that took months of planning to execute the fi final details for special dignitaries, Chairman, Joint Chief of Staff, Joseph, General Joseph Dunford, Jr., and General James McConville. Their visit was made possible by the BAA, mm -hmm. and the Maricon Committee was able to arrange a meet and greet and photo op with our 2017 honored veterans on the starters platform on race morning. I'd like to personally thank BAA Operations Manager Doug Flannery for coordinating the General's visit. To see the pride in the eyes of our veterans, Fred Betts, Kathleen O'Leary, Don Creswell, and Bob Lavoy, the men and women who paved the way for us to enjoy the marathon, and have served our country with valor, our heartwarming. <clears throat> Another Hopkinton special moment was when Selectman Claire Wright presented women's running legend Catherine Switzer with a commemorative gift from the Hopkinton Historical Society organized, recognizing her 50th anniversary of her historical marathon run in 1967. I'm so honored to work with all my colleagues on the marathon committee, and they should be proud of how they made Hopkinton shine once again. Their commitment and dedication is outstanding. I'd like to thank the committee, the Board of Selectmen, Town Manager's Office, Police, Fire, DPW, Schools, Board of Health, and Parks and Recreation for Departments for all your support. In closing, I send a heartfelt thank you to all the Hopkinton residents and the businesses for their patience and continued support. As chair of the Hopkins Marathon Committee, I look forward to seeing everyone next April as we plan for the 122nd Boston Marathon. It all steps here. Just awesome. a few thoughts. Very well said, Dottie. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Well Thanks, done. Dottie. Excellent job. <laughs> okay, next up, Logan. Uh, we have a young man here this evening that would like to address the board. And he's going to be joined by either his mom or his dad. Uh, Mr. Chair, while Logan's coming up, I would like to echo Dottie's comments on the marathon and just say maybe this is because it's my first year as a selectman uh, being part of the marathon and being from the, from the start to the end of the start. Uh, it just was, it was amazing to see Bob Lavoie up there with the, with the starter's gun uh, and to see the reaction that that four-star general had just to be able to speak to Bob Lavoie. Uh, I mean, this guy is a, a, a 
unbelievably renowned four-star Marine, and he was taken back by the accomplishments that Bob Lavoy will never talk you to us about. And it yeah. just everything on it was just it, it went smooth, it went great, and I was very proud to be part of it. And uh, and Dottie, thank you very much for doing what you do. And uh, that's it. Great, thank you. Very well said. And and okay. Mr. Sestari. Yeah, just at, uh, at the risk of us uh, pushing that 930 number too closely. Um, you know, I've been, <laughs> I've been going to it for a while as a selectman and, and, uh, and also not as a selectman. And I thought it was amazing this year. Each year seems to get better. Um, and, you know, despite, despite all the security measures that we have to take, um, you know, which are, are certainly welcome in this day and age, uh, you know, we still, we still manage to make it better. And when I say we, I mean Hopkinton as a town, but Dottie, it's, uh, it's largely behind your efforts. So thank you very much. What are you going to do next year? How are you going to top this one? Great job. Fireworks. Mrs. Wright. Uh, I was just going to say Dottie, in her own humble, unassuming way, talks about the commitment and dedication of everybody else, but the commitment and dedication of you is unmatched in this town. Very well said. Excellent. And well, Logan. Okay, <laughs> next up for public comment, we have a young man named Logan who is here, and he wants to address the board on an issue that is of concern to him. Logan, please go right ahead. Dear Mr. Brian Hare, Chairman, I am Logan Sullivan. I am 10 years old. I go to Hopkins School in Hopkinton, and I'm in fourth grade. I moved from Connecticut in August 2016. I learned that in health class that Hopkinton is not on the Tobacco 21 list. This is a list of which towns have to be 21 or older to buy tobacco. Tobacco is not good for you, for your health, or and other people's health. I think that we should all be 21 or, or older to buy tobacco, but hope no one will ever want to buy tobacco and make people's health at risk from smoking. It can make anyone sick and get lung cancer. Please help get Hopkinton on the 21 list. How tobacco 21 list. Thank you, Logan Sullivan. Logan, you did an excellent job presenting your points. Thank you for coming tonight. Uh, any members have any interest in putting this on a uh, future agenda to discuss? Sure. I'll put it on the future agenda to discuss. Absolutely. Okay. If it's important to a, a, a boy that's in fourth grade, it should be important to adults that are over 21. And uh, Logan, thank you for coming in and, and uh, putting us in our place and getting us on the ball for this. We'll certainly get this rolling for you. Mrs. Lazarus, if you could take this action item, please, and just do a little bit of sort of bylaw Mass General Law investigative work specific to the Tobacco 21 list. Yep. And then if we could add it to a future agenda item, that would be great. Okay? Mm -hmm. Everybody good? Yep. Everybody good? good? Logan, you good? You did a great job, young nice man. Job. Congratulations. Thank you for coming Thank tonight. You. Thank you, Logan. Have a good night. Thank you. All right. Anyone else for public comment this evening? Public forum. Okay, with that, we'll move on to item number three, which is the consent agenda. We have minutes from 425.17 and 5.117. We also have under item two, uh, parade permits from Michael Whalen, chairman of the Veterans Celebration Committee for the Memorial Day ceremonies to be held on Monday, May 29, 2017. Always a great event. Uh, two from Aaron Nemzer on behalf of the DMSC Sports. Uh, for the Boston Marathon Jimmy Fund Walk, I believe it's going to actually be Mr. Foise tonight if anybody has any questions, correct? Mm -hmm. uh, from Teresa Waite on behalf of the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation for the 2017 CF Cycle for Life to be held on Saturday, October 7th at 8.30 a.m. Item 3 is a fee waiver request uh, from Tara Sando on behalf of the HPTA for the uh, upcoming event they're having. Ambulance gift funds. Uh, we've got a lot of ambulance gift funds that came in in memory of firefighter Tom McIntyre. Um, and then finally, a board of selectmen, uh, will, the board will consider accepting the resignation of Nancy Haynes from the Hopkinton Tax Relief Committee. Anybody want to break out any items in the consent agenda? I'll break out four. Item four is the ambulance gift funds, correct? Yes. Okay, anything else? This is right. I know you want to move this along, Mr. Chairman, and I will, but I actually have some questions or comments on each item except for the minutes and first parade permit for the Memorial Day. So 
Sorry about that. Okay, so the chair will entertain a motion to approve the minutes of February, I'm sorry, April 25th, 2017 and 5 1 2017, as well as the parade permit for the uh, Veterans Celebration Committee, which is going to be on Monday, 20, May 29th, 2017. So moved. Second. Okay, second. Thank you. Any discussion on those two items? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? They're unanimous and so carried. But I do encourage everybody to go to the Memorial Day celebration. The Memorial Day celebration, absolutely. Or well, the great, remembrance, actually. Great event, yeah. Yeah, it's probably better. More of a remembrance, yeah. exactly. Uh, okay, so then the second parade permit was for uh, the Boston Marathon Jimmy Fun Walk to be held on Sunday, September 24, 2017, starting at a late 5.30 a.m., uh, the walk will be along the Boston Marathon route. Mrs. Wright. Uh, I'm on I'm on a litter uh, <laughs> rampage right now. And I do want to mention that their litter control plan discussed litter control at the Hopkinton Start area. But litter control, especially with a, a lengthy walk, will, it, will more likely occur through the race course when people get tired if they have a water bottle or whatever and they discard it. So um, I would like that confirmed that the course will be swept, um, that the litter control <coughs> should take place throughout the course, not just at the starting point. Swept meaning literally or swept meaning well, figuratively? Not meaning literally, but, but uh, someone needs to go through the course and see that there is litter throughout the course that is picked up because that's where it may occur not just at the starting point okay. um, that and and I do want to mention too on the application um, I understand mr. Foise is going to be the lucky person in charge but I would like to see that that application be changed to indicate that the phone contact we asked for is um, an event day phone contact um, not a phone contact for the general applicant but an event day phone contact of someone that can be reached. So that was my only thing, but I am concerned that it, it covered the route, not just the starting point. Mr. Foisey. Thank you, Mrs. Wright, Mr. Herr. Uh, the, the process is to clean up center schools, the surrounding common, and then the waste management company does do a sweep down the route after the last runner leaves and that is the process okay now uh, my personal focus is right around the common and and center school because there are no food stops or anything between here and the ashland town line so there's typically not a lot of additional but um, i can commit to you that after the last walkers leave town i'll i'll take a separate run down there and make sure that it's it's swept okay you know, if they have a water bottle or whatever to drink on the way when they get thirsty part way through, it, that's it, when it gets dropped yeah. by the side of the road, not at we'll, the beginning. I'll so. put that in the op manual for this year to make sure we do a, an extra sweep. And uh, it, is my cell phone good enough for the oh, day of contact? Oh, no, no. It, not you at all. It's it's the application that I want the line changed that it makes clear the all contact right. is event day contact. I'll let Aaron know that. That's more for our end. But our application is what needs to be modified for all yeah. parade purposes, yeah. right? Not phone day of. Any other questions on item two or parade two? Any other questions from anyone else on parade two? <coughs> Chair, I entertain a motion to approve parade two based on the discussion with Mrs. Wright and Mr. Foise. So moved. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? It's unanimous. All set. Thank, Thank you. you. Item three under parades from Teresa Wade on behalf of the Cystic Fibrosis, Cystic Fibrosis Foundation for the 2017 CF Cycle for Life to be held on Saturday, October 7th, 2017 at 8.30 a.m. This is right. My concern, uh, I did not see our town application included. There was a very lengthy, lengthy document of pages and pages of safety concerns that the organization put out, but I didn't have the benefit of the salient questions that are 
answered on our application. One of them included road closures, and I did not see any police comment. I noticed that there are about 350 riders, and some of the streets they're riding on are extremely dangerous streets, even for a walker. Granite Street, Lumber Street, Fruit Street, Cross Street. Um, so I am a little worried about the safety aspect of this race on those streets without <coughs> any input that I saw from the police or any input about a safety plan. Those are really, really dangerous streets. Mr. Kamala or Mrs. Lazarus? We have an email from uh, Lieutenant John Porter. We have worked closely with the organization to lay out a traffic and safety plan. We would only request that the organizer meet with the police department one month prior to go over any last minute changes or concerns. So the police department did review the application and they okay. submitted this. And, and we shared that with the uh, report that was in front of you. All right. All right. Okay. Yeah, we've got that Fine. I, I don't yeah. know how you're going to have 350 bike riders on, on Lumber Street on parts of it, but that's up to them as long as it's as long as the police are working with the applicant this is this is starting in another town by the time they get there it'll be well dispersed right. I would think. those are dangerous streets any further discussion on item three under parade permits chair will entertain a motion to approve the parade permit for the uh, cystic fibrosis fibrosis foundation 2017 cf cycle for life to be held on saturday october 7th 2017. so moved mr chairman second, second. okay any further discussion all those in favor aye. Aye. aye any opposed all set fee waiver request is the next item the board of selectmen consider approving a fee waiver request from tara sander <coughs> on behalf of the hpta for a special temporary alcohol license fee issued at the april 25th board of selectmen meeting the hpta is a non-profit organization uh, mrs wright my concern with this is a larger question for the board in that um, there are a lot of these one-day licenses being given out now for many facilities. By and large, they are for nonprofits. That's been part of the selling point to this board that these are important fundraisers and we should be helping these nonprofits. So um, I don't see this as a standalone. Um, and I also understand that alcohol sales are a key fundraising component. They make good money. That's why they want to do this. Um, so I'm just questioning, is all these other one-day alcohol licenses that are going to come for many, many nonprofit organizations, that was the crux of the discussion at town meeting the other night about uh, nonprofits at town facilities. Um, are we willing to waive all these fees? Um, you know, it, it seems that the town is making this amenity available. Um, I think that maybe the town should have something that comes back in the form of a fee for having this available to them because it's not going to be just MPTA, HPTA. There's going to be a lot of them. I'm not. I'm not being a curmudgeon here. I'm just. I'm just looking down the road at what comes in and the number of. Uh, Permits that are, you know, coming coming through for nonprofits to do this kind of thing. Mr. Chair, I, I guess I would simply offer that uh, an organization such as this is directly benefiting the, the town and the town's residents. Uh, so for us to uh, require a fee and basically have it come out of programming that's happening in our schools is really, you know, only hurting ourselves. Um, I can definitely see where we might want to have a discussion. If it's, you know, some other nonprofit that's, I don't know, I'm just pulling one out of the air, not nothing against them, but, you know, benefiting dogs or, you know, benefiting pigeons, uh, you know, then we can have the discussion, I would think. But when it's directly benefiting uh, the students in our schools, uh, I'm more inclined to waive the fee. Okay. Mr. Catino. Well, that's how I see it. Again, I, I bring this up all the time. We're one pair of pants moving money from one pocket to another. And so we really do have to be careful when we when um, uh, when we're taking from from one town organization really to another. But I, I agree with Mr. Sestari's that we can look at the. I, I think we should look at it at a, at a, on a broader uh, scale and see if there's maybe we can do a reduced fee for other uh, other uh, nonprofits. But when, when it comes to a real town one, if the you know, the library wants to come to us or DPW or somebody else, it's the same thing. I think it's one pocket to another, especially when they're. They're going to be um, benefiting our youth in this case, or something. Mr. Testone. Well, yeah, I, I see. 
I see both sides of it, and I, what Mrs. Wright is saying is, you know, this is a systemic thing where everyone that's labeled nonprofit um, shouldn't be able to come in and get waived. I, I, and I see that every everything that we're every, every permit that we're looking at, every waiver is being looked at individually. So um, I think that we should be able to have our decision on who gets waived and, and just because you're a nonprofit doesn't mean that you're that you're going to get waived so uh, and I I totally agree with uh, Mr. Sestari and Mr. Catino that when it benefits the schools the you know directly our town uh, I'm good with you know as a rule I'm good with waiving those those fees if it's you know the the uh, pigeon relief fund that happens to be a nonprofit then no I'm not good with that uh, they should have to pay that so um, that's it. Okay. Uh, so we do, to your point, I think it's a fair question. We do routinely mm -hmm. offer fee waivers to nonprofits, typically Hopkinton based. I'm not convinced it's always the case, but maybe that's what we really need to focus in on going forward. Um, but for the most part, it's it is a part of the process. The dollars are not, you know, substantial. It's not <coughs> going to make or break our budget. Uh, I would. I think for this particular case, without getting into a big, you know, discussion about who's who in the nonprofit world here, um, I think the HPTA does great work. It should be a great event, uh, and for this particular one, I would support the fee waiver. So, any other thoughts? Well, just going forward, I'm not questioning the good work of the HPTA. I am just looking at the bigger picture that this board going forward will be placed with making value judgments over who's a better cause than who isn't. And um, for the organization requesting, this is a cost of doing business. They're doing this event because it's going to make them a significant profit. I just think in the long run, it would be better for the board to treat all organizations equitably and not be judging in the future who's worthy and who is less worthy, it puts us, it'll put us in an awkward position. But I'm outvoted here, so I've made my case. Fair enough. Being on this board is an awkward position. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, it's awkward. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Moving on. Um, so the chair will entertain a motion to approve the fee waiver request for the HPTA uh, event to be held on April 25th, 2017 for the all alcohol so license. Second. We have a motion and a second. Motion by... Mr. Mr. Sestari, Sestari and a second, second by Mr. Tedson. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Okay. Four to one. Item number five, four, I'm sorry, is the ambulance fund gifts. The Board of Selectmen will consider accepting several ambulance fund gifts in memory of firefighter Tom McIntyre. Mr. Uh, Tedstone. Yep. So, um, obviously, I have a, a, a vested interest in the subject here with Mr. McIntyre. Um, it's great to see that, uh, you know, just, I just did a quick total. It's almost $3,000 that's come in in the last week since his passing to this ambulance fund. Uh, it speaks volumes of what a person Mr. McIntyre was. And I wanted to go on record, and even though the fire chief is not here, uh, Deputy Fire Chief Miller is here, and just say what an absolutely unbelievable, unbelievable job uh, they did to orchestrate the funeral that was put on last week. Uh, we had a, a meeting on Tuesday, which was the night before his funeral. Um, if any of you got to, to see it, whether it be online or live, uh, there were no stops that were, I mean, I mean, all the stops were pulled uh, between the towers, the, the fire trucks carrying the casket and carrying the flowers. It was just done to the nines, and um, you guys did an absolutely phenomenal job and from the bottom of my heart as a selectman and my heart as one of his very good friends I thank you and it's a good reflection to see that there's all this money coming into the ambulance fund which will continuously go to the, the betterment of Hopkinton so his legacy is is not done um, he's got a bunch more stuff that uh, that that's probably going to come down the road and and uh, I'm going to see what I can do to to uh, to keep that legacy going personally but this ambulance fund gift, 3000 bucks in a week, I think it's great, and I, I think you're going to see it keep coming in. And uh, But just to go on the record and say what, a, what an absolutely phenomenal job the town did pulling together this funeral and remembering him and honoring 
someone that deserved to be honored like that. Uh, I think it's a wonderful job, and thank you very much, uh, Deputy. I almost called you Lieutenant, but thank you very much, Deputy, uh, and pass that along to your colleagues, uh, uh, you know, town-wide, uh, many towns. You know, I know Milford was out there. Uh, every town that had uh, Hopedale put their, their ladder out there, Ashland gave the flag. Uh, just, it was an unbelievable job, and, and thank you very much. Okay, very well said. Thank you. The chair will entertain a motion to accept the ambulance fund gifts in memory of firefighter Tom McIntyre. So moved. Second. We have a motion to <clears throat> second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Uh, committee reg committee resignation. The Board of Selectmen will consider accepting the resignation of Nancy Haynes from the Hopkinton Tax Relief Committee. Mrs. Wright. The only thing I wanted to mention, and we are sorry to see Mrs. Haynes resign, is she, to point out again to the townspeople watching, Mrs. Haynes mentioned that with her resignation, two out of the three at-large posts on um, the Tax Relief Committee are vacant. And at our last meeting, I mentioned how there are two and coming to be three vacancies on the Historical Commission. Um, again, I really urge people that want to give back to this town to go on the town website, see where the positions are, because we, um, we very much need our volunteers to step up on all of these important boards. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Kamala, if we could make sure we have a letter that we can send to Mrs. Haynes, please, that would be great. Um, any further discussion? Chair, entertain a motion to accept the resignation of Nancy Haynes from the Hopkinton Tax Relief Committee. So moved. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. <coughs> okay, item number four on tonight's agenda at 7.15, and we are right on time, thank you all, is to get a legislative delegation visit from our colleagues on Beacon Hill. Uh, this evening, I believe Dennis is here and Representative Dykema are here. If you folks could join us and come on up and say hello, that would be much appreciated. Why don't we start with our representative, and then we'll go to our senator's designate. It's great to be here. Thank you for the invitation, as always. Nice to see you. And it's that time of year again, budget, yeah. budget season. <laughs> Budgets. So... Um, on behalf of both Senator Spoka and myself, I know you know Dennis, um, and I think the Senator has been in touch with um, the office about her inability to be here tonight. She's certainly with us in spirit, but I'll be giving an overview for the both of us, um, and then Dennis will make a few comments at the end. Um, so as you know, the, um, as I said, the House budget was just um, completed a couple of weeks ago, so I thought I would give a quick, quick update of where that process, how that process played out, kind of where it is for the town, some of the critical items that I know are of importance to the board, uh, as well as a number of other projects that um, both the center and I have been working on on behalf of the community. Um, first of all, it's sort of a um, broad strokes of, of concerns that we had going into the budget. Obviously, there are a lot of um, moving parts going on with the economy these days, a lot of decisions um, being made at the federal level that do have trickle-down impacts for us at the state level as well as at the community level. And I would say that that was kind of the theme, um, if you will, in coming up with the projected uh, revenue numbers for um, 2018 budget. Just to give you a sense of the potential impacts, um, especially with respect to health care, um, there are some conversations going on that could affect the revenues that come down from the federal government to our state programs. And, and why is that important? Um, our state revenues incorporated into the budget are approximately $27 billion. Um, when you include the federal piece of that, it's over $40 billion. So that's a substantial piece of that pie that's federal money um, that we need to be aware of when we're budgeting about the potential uncertainties of where that money is going to come from and will we have to backfill as a state if there are changes made there. The health care piece in particular always rises to the top in the conversation. The uh, health care or the percentage of the state budget right now that is consumed by health care is roughly 40 percent. If there are changes or, or the the largest potential changes that folks are looking at um, based on federal decisions are roughly a, a two billion dollar difference there so um, we're watching that very closely I'm on the health care finance committee this session where really that is our top priority to try and read the tea leaves as best we can and plan for contingencies should 
various scenarios happen and how we're going to address that at the state level. So that's an ongoing challenge. But that said, we uh, need to move forward with the budget and we need to plan on some numbers. Um, and uh, we also have, uh, as we always try to do, sort of um, use best budgeting practices as we enter the budget conversation. So just to give a, a sense of kind of what some of the things are that we're looking for in terms of uh, best management practices, one-time revenues have been a substantial part of the state, rev state um, budget conversation since the recession. Uh, we've been working hard to kind of scale back our use of one-time revenues um, to be more uh, stable operationally, as well as um, not rely on our, our stabilization fund. And not only that, but continue to build the stabilization fund up to a target of roughly $2 billion. Um, we're getting there. We're about 1.4, based on what came out of the House budget. Uh, and hopefully, year over year, we'll continue to build that back. Um, by way of um, improvements, or I guess, how, how can we do things better? How can we do things more efficiently? There was a provision in the House budget that has to do with the earned income tax credit. And it essentially closes a loophole for out-of-state residents that will essentially result in about $10 million of savings for the state going forward on an annual basis. The line items that are of particular interest to the community I know are education funding, including Chapter 70, which we were able to do a $30 per pupil increase this year, which is you know, sort of in line with where we've been in the past, a little less than last year, but um, totaling about $6.3 million for the community of Hawkington. The circuit breaker funding, which is for special education, which is also, I know, a big uh, ticket item for the schools. Roughly level funded at about a 70% reimbursement rate in the House budget at $395,000, roughly there. Uh, unrestricted general government aid was a little bit of an increase, up to $785,000. Um, formula Council on Aging Grants, which go to our senior center, um, based on the number of seniors that actually use the center, a little bit of a bump there, um, up to $31,000. Chapter 115, Veterans Benefits. I know Hopkinton is a very veteran-friendly community. Um, a lot of 115 benefits, which are the state benefits that come back to our veterans. Um, looks like there's been an increase in the number of veterans receiving those benefits, and there's, that's been reflected in the amount of money that will be coming back from the state to reimburse the town for those um, benefits. On the same veterans theme, we put in the House budget a tax credit for employers who hire veterans. So it's a $2,000 tax credit for the first two years that a veteran is hired that goes back to the employer to try and encourage and bring down our veterans' unemployment rate, which is uh, unfortunately substantially higher than the average unemployment rate for folks. So that's a big priority for the legislature overall, and glad we could move that forward in this budget. Um, libraries saw a little bit of an increase, and uh, Hopkinton received their percentage um, of the Chapter 90 money for transportation, which was um, recently, just within the last couple of weeks, finalized of $651,000, which is, again, a reimbursement that comes back for roadways, bridges, sidewalks, transportation improvements. Two other items that were um, focused on or, or priority items in the House budget this year, which I know are important to the community, one being um, opiate abuse. I'm always surprised, no matter where I go, there is um, a, an impact. You know, pretty much every family, I think, in the Commonwealth has been touched by the opiate abuse epidemic at this point, and that's reflected in the budget as well, with an $8 million increase, including some new treatment beds in the Commonwealth to deal with that issue. Uh, also, a, a fairly substantial increase for services for the disabled. Other items that we've been working on over the last year, both the center uh, in my office as well as working as one of the co-chairs of our Metro West legislative delegation. So we as legislators representing the Metro West area work together to try and move forward initiatives that benefit the whole region at large. Um, and one of those uh, initiatives was uh, related to the, in the implementation of all electronic tolling which I don't know if any of you have used the pike in recent uh, months, the electronic tolling uh, is a significantly more convenient way to pay tolls. Uh, however, as you may remember, there was a proposal when the all electronic tolling first was proposed, it came along with a fairly substantial increase in toll rates for uh, drivers from our region because of the, the tolling 
uh, gates were going to be put in different locations. So we worked together as a caucus and we're very uh, vocally opposed to that happening and we were very pleased that the Baker administration really responded to our local concerns and at the end of the day, the net result was we kept those uh, tolls essentially where they had been prior to the improvements. So again, not, not a uh, step forward, but at least not a step backward, which I consider a victory. Um, I did want to acknowledge um, our representative from the fire department, Deputy Ch um, Chief Miller is here. One of the areas we've been working on related again to the all electronic tolling is there have been some access issues to the Mass Pike for our public safety um, folks getting out to respond to incidents. And for my district, that impacts not only Hopkinton, but also Westboro and Southboro, who are kind of tag teaming it to provide the best response possible there. Um, we have connected the chief with uh, the state police, who also are going to have similar concerns around limits to turnarounds as a result of removal of the toll booths, as well as the improvements that are going to be happening around 495 and 90 which is another initiative that our caucus really pushed to get back on the docket after it was removed. Um, but as we move forward with those improvements, which will improve congestion as well as support our local business owners, um, we also have to take into account some of the public safety concerns, and this is a great time to be doing that. So we're working very closely uh, with the folk, local folks to make sure that happens. Uh, lastly, um, before we take questions, and of course, welcome to any questions you have, is related to the commuter rail. Um, since I've been in office, and I know since the senator certainly has been here, there's been, you know, questions and, and concerns about the reliability uh, and the timeliness of service on the commuter rail. And uh, several months ago, the lieutenant governor, working with a number of local legislators, took a specific look at the Worcester-Framingham commuter rail line to see if we could do a better job, not only with responding to the needs of riders on the commuter rail, but also the reliability. And so I was part of that working group, really pleased to be able to bring the concerns of our communities back. Uh, and that new schedule will be taking place or, or taking effect within the next week or so, week and a half or so. And it should, again, be an improved schedule, but more importantly, be more reliable. There's been a, a greater buffer time left between various trains, so we won't have this domino effect. So if there's one late train, it essentially affects the whole um, schedule. So hopefully those riding the train into Boston or reverse commute will see those improvements uh, and find them helpful. So on that note, I will turn it over to Dennis. Great, uh, great summary, uh, Representative. Uh, first, I'd like to uh, send uh, S Senator Spilker's apologies for not being here tonight. She had a bicycle accident uh, several days ago, so she's still recovering from that. Uh, but she did want me to send her regards to the board. Um, and um, after that uh, great summary by the representative, I think the only thing I would add um, is that on the state level, there is some uh, red flags, clouds in the horizon in the recent tax uh, receipts, uh, both uh, March and April. Uh, you may have read in the paper that uh, uh, April's receipts were uh, about $240 million below benchmark, uh, which is sizable. Um, there is uh, a wait and see, so to speak, because not all of the uh, tax receipts have been processed. Uh, so we're looking really for May numbers. Um, but there is some concern, both as the representative said, at the federal level, now at the state level, uh, below benchmark um, concerns. Uh, the governor has stated and been on record that this year uh, deficit would not be on the backs of local aid. Uh, so he made that uh, promise uh, publicly um, for this year. Um, obviously, uh, as we go forward to next year, the Senate budget is coming out uh, next week. As you know, uh, Senator Spook is the chairwoman of, uh, of the uh, Ways and Means Senate. Um, and uh, she's uh, obviously very close to the situation and working diligently uh, with the governor um, and uh, the legislative delegation to uh, work through the, the potential issues. So, Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you both for coming, and thank you for the updates. Uh, if I could just kind of go this way first. Mr. Kamalo, the numbers that Representative uh, Dykema put out, uh, specific to the A numbers and so on, do those align with what we've recently have been playing around with and put forth in our budgets for 2018? Yes, they do. <laughs> no great shockers there? At this point, we're still awaiting the 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 outcome of the state's review of the likely impact in the reduction of the receipts, mm -hmm. local receipts by the state. Good. Yeah. But otherwise, the, the budget is, uh, is approved. The town meeting is consistent with the numbers that we've received through uh, DOR. Okay. Yeah. 
Thank you. Mr. Tedstone, any questions? Uh, no, to co uh, comment. Um, so, Carolyn, it's been, I've been on now for a year and as a selectman, and most of the events that I wind up going to, you're there. So, you've been, uh, you're, you're one of the very few, and I'm going to get yelled at for this, but I'm one, uh, you're one of the very few um, political entities that my wife and I ever agree on. So, you kind of <laughs> calm things in my house. And um, I, I think you're, uh, you do a great job, and, and you're a great resource, and I know that you're uh, an email or a Facebook uh, comment away, and you're always very responsive to getting back to me personally on, on on questions that I've had for you. And thank you very much for your accessibility and your availability and your your uh, your candor with the answers back. And thank you for making my wife and I get along for a few minutes tonight. <laughs> <I'm honored. laughs> you are in big trouble, dude. She is still at lacrosse picking my son up, so she is not watching this. Mr. Catino. Yeah, I just, I really want to thank you also and Senator Spilka, especially for that, that Metro West collaboration. Right. You know, we really need that help sometimes for this area because uh, the, the, other, the other groups, you know, coming from the South Shore and all of that, you know, the, um, that whole artery depression would seem to have been made on the backs of us out here. And to have you guys out there supporting us, and I know I say that to you and Senator Spoke all the time. Whenever I see you, thank you for sticking up for us when it comes to the Mass Bike. It's important, you know. And and, and we also here in, in Hopkinton, as, as uh, the town manager just alluded to, we we also sit in the edge of our seats for that backfill. You're worried about the you know, the feds, and we worry about it coming from the state. You know, even though we look like we're really strong, but because we're doing a, another underride this year and pulling pulling some of the uh, tax levy out of, off the uh, the backs of the residents, but we still wait and, and worry about you know, when the receipts go down, uh, is something going to happen to us. But uh, you know that that two K benefit to the um, uh, employers for for, to, for hiring veterans, and, and that's a great initiative. Thanks very much. Really, thank and thanks for everything. I totally echo what he says. You're doing a great job. I love when we go the Boy Scout stuff together and everything. You're always there. You come to everything. Thank you very much. This is right. Thank you both for coming. Uh, I have several questions. Um, one for Dennis, uh, you're mentioning the budget shortfall. Is there a, a breakdown between residential um, tax income and business? And do you have a sense of what is driving that? Well, that's, that's, per, that's the uh, perplexing issue uh, facing everyone in the sense that the economy is great, employment uh, levels are low, uh, yet receipts are, are down. Um, and people are trying to figure out what that is. There's a lot of uh, speculation uh, that some of the things that are going on in Washington around the uh, tax breaks that are being occurred, that people are holding off on stocks and other investments uh, tools. So that uh, revenue was down. Uh, but there's, there's really trying to figure out what is causing that. Some of the things is on the online uh, shopping is causing some concerns. Um, so there are many factors um, that people are looking at and trying to come up with a, with a solution, but it's not a simple uh, one or two uh, points of, of interest. It's, it's just uh, several. So, for clarification, yep. if I may, Mr. Chair, sure. then you are saying that there is a, a drop in both individual mm -hmm. tax yep. payments yep. as well yep. as yes. business. Yep. It's not yep. like no. it's no. significant right. business That's right. down That's right. yep. It's across yep. the board. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to just ask Carolyn about the um, the commuter rail situation because I know the unpredictability or the unreliability of the trains has been an issue lately. Um, so is what they've determined is that it's more of a scheduling issue and not a major infrastructure issue? I mean, it seems like scheduling is a lot easier to address and if it's if it's you know track or, or, or engines and trains um. it's it's actually more the infrastructure concerns mm. and and what yeah. you know what we attempted to do with the schedule was to recognize the infrastructure concerns recognize that if if there is a locomotive for example that is late getting started or, or won't start for some reason yeah. <clears throat> you may have one late train but at least if we add enough buffer between the trains that won't have a domino yeah. effect on the entire right. schedule right. Right. so it's really these workarounds well well on one hand we're trying to make more you know, targeted investments where we have available funding in the infrastructure yeah. improvements and we've done a lot of um, 
upgrades to the line to get rid of the heat restrictions, for example, mm -hmm. which has been an ongoing project. And there are some new locomotives and some, some um, maintenance issues that are being addressed. But while we're doing that, we're also changing the schedule. So it's sort of a twofer right. approach. So you're anticipating there's going to be equipment problems and you're, you're working, you're, you're going to work around it so that right. the system can absorb as best we can. Right. That as right. best you can. And my last line, um, cover your ears. Uh, <laughs> for this, I did just want to mention that I had sent a letter both to you and to Senator Spilk and gotten a response back. Um, I, I did express my concerns about, uh, and there are two bills moving through, one at the House and one at the Senate level, to address this solar um, tax exemption for towns that, you know, we're addressing it by trying to get the pilot agreements in place so we don't lose those tax revenue. But the concern that, you know, if, if cities and towns lose that amount of property tax revenue out of land, it, it can add up to a significant amount. So, I, you know, I do hope that you will understand how that affects the towns and, um, you know, support the legislation to try to make that right for cities and towns so they don't, they don't lose that amount of revenue. So that's just my, my comment. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Mr. Sestari. How you doing? How you doing? Um, it's an incredibly easy bandwagon to jump on to say <laughs> thank you and uh, acknowledge the great things that you do for our area, and I'll jump on that gladly. Um, I guess one of my concerns, you started walking into it as, as we went along, and it's not so much, uh, I guess, uh, affecting our local numbers directly, but when we start talking about uh, the tolls and we start talking about the commuter rail and we just go to the MBTA in general. Um, I think it was mentioned uh, about the central artery project and how uh, that that was, you know, uh, disproportionately put on the backs of people who use the turnpike and who weren't necessarily getting the benefit from the central artery. Um, so I do appreciate your fighting the tolls and, and getting them at least to not go up <laughs> as we see this project that's going on. Uh, I can say the project that's going on, uh, you know, I spend every day on the turnpike. Uh, it seems to make the commute easier. I don't think it's really lessened it at all. Um, I don't know what's going to happen once all the construction is complete. You know, I guess we'll just wait and see. Um, but then going more to the commuter rail and the MBTA, um, you know, that just seems to be another thing, you know, about six months ago, I, I took a look at uh, the MBTA's uh, proposed budget, and I came to the realization that that's another large subsidy that, uh, you know, is being put on the shoulders of all the taxpayers in Massachusetts. And when we look at the, um, I guess, the historical mismanagement, uh, you know, I know that there's work trying to get everything back in, in line, but the mismanagement uh, from an operational standpoint. And then to me, I look at it and also say, you know, to some degree fiscally, um, you know, how, how, is that, how is that moving along? I know that the governor was trying to address that. And, you know, they brought in somebody new to, to run it. And then my impression was that she ran <laughs> after a year. And I'm wondering if there's progress being made and if uh, I'm sure there's continued focus, but, um, you know, can we ever expect this to be something that's more, more self-sufficient? I guess on the self-sufficiency side, um, the answer is, you know, obviously we can do a lot better than we have been been doing. I think if you look at, at um, public transit systems across the country, there aren't any, I don't believe, that don't run without a subsidy. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, generally the practice is to subsidize public transportation um, for the many benefits that it provides. But, you know, we've got um, Secretary Pollock, who is um, new, is incredibly hands-on, and really has been digging into the weeds of um, what makes it, you know, what makes the trains run on time, dealt with, you know, the equipment side of, of the snow <coughs> removal issue, which kind of shut the trains down. I mean, the bottom line is, is it comes down to investments. You know, I, I think the management and the fiscal oversight with the, you know, the fiscal, fiscal oversight board that was put in place a number of years ago has really helped, I think, increase the transparency of those numbers and kind of um, make it more publicly visible, if you will. But what that doesn't solve is the, is the funding issue. And I think that remains the underlying concern and the underlying issue is that we simply do not have the funds to do the types of investments that we need to really run a 21st century 
um, public transit system. And it was interesting, I had a conversation, so we've got a new um, gentleman who's running the um, commuter rail, um, and he was part of these meetings that we were looking at the schedule. And the interesting thing is what, you know, my question was, wh why is it that, you know, Germany can have a train that arrives to the third, you know, to the second of when they say it's going to arrive and we, you know, we have this kind of 15 minute window <laughs> where we hope that's considered on time. Um, and it was interesting because Massachusetts in particular was one of the first states in the nation to have a public transit system. Um, we have so much upgrade. We almost have to upgrade the entire system. And I'll give you the example. You know, in, in Europe, you have the trains where people step out flush with the platform, where here you have to step up into the train. That is a major, and that, you know, that causes delays. Simply the act of having to wait for people to step up into a train causes a degree of variation in the scheduling that's enough to set off the schedule significantly. So it's small things like that. Um, we're just going to have to get creative around how we can work around them, how, how we can sort of retrofit some things where possible, but it's all going to take some additional funding, and it's been a conversation for, certainly since I've been in the legislature, where that funding is going to come from. Um, as we look at this health care number continue to grow, all the money that we put into health care is money that comes out of things like transportation, and I think particularly for our Metro West region, um, which is a growing economic region, we don't have the reverse commute schedule that that our employers are telling us, that Dell EMC is telling us, that other large employers are telling us they want to bring employees out from the city who want to live in the city and work out here. We need them here, but yet we don't have the public transit to be able to feel that. So in a sense, it's, you know, it's a chicken and egg. We need to fund the transit system before we can grow the economy that results in greater you know, funding available for the transit system. So we're getting there, but the, the revenue conversation is not going to go away. Dennis, I don't know what to add. Uh, yeah, I just have a follow-on to that. Has there been any um, any more talk on more gantries going somewhere else, like like having the South Shore people pay for their own artery depression, you know? And that maybe they, I hate being the one that says it's another place to uh, to tax somebody, but you know we've been we've been paying it for for 40 years out here. And um, is it possible to have, oh, sorry, I'm, I'm talking. Is it possible to have you know, somebody else start picking up some of the slack? Well, sure, uh, certainly I can, I can tell you that the Metro West uh, legislative delegation has been leading that effort of trying to get uh, other toll roads um, along the, in other states, uh, the expressway and other ways. Uh, they've been always talking about that. Uh, but it's an uphill battle uh, because uh, there are other, if they don't have it, and to sell that is very, very difficult. And the equity issue is something that the, this de delegation brings up at every single meeting. Um, but it's a difficult sell uh, statewide. And I will say one of the things we've been hearing for many years is that we can't do that because there are federal limits on what we can do. We met as a legislative caucus with the federal um, highway administrator to really hear from the horse's mouth, so to speak, what are the limits and what are the restrictions. And the, the restrictions are actually fewer than we had understood previously, which does create some opportunity. It's obviously still a huge political um, challenge. But again, I think the opportunity there is greater than what we had thought, and we're continuing to, to talk about it whenever we can. Thanks. Sorry. I think we have the best state rep and one of the, and the best state senator in Massachusetts. I really do. And I know a lot of folks on Beacon Hill. There's some great people down there. And you guys are way up there, always, in my mind. And you got elected around the same time I first got elected to this board. And we've done a lot together over the years. And, and it's always an honor to work with both Senator Spilka and Representative Dykema. A couple of questions, if I could, though, please. Uh, one, how do you feel about our uh, DOT funding for our downtown quarter project. Everybody still feel good about that? We've got to think it's about, I want to say $9 million. Does that sound about right? Yeah, right around eight and a half million. You're marked to support our work in improving our downtown. Yeah, I think it's it's for 2019, I think, is the year that the it's on the tip uh, for it. And uh, we just went through the tip process, uh, and it has been voted in. It is now up for public comment. So I would expect, uh, I, I would ask that you, as a board, uh, send a letter of support for that. Uh, the MPO uh, will be uh, voting on it on the uh, this month. Uh, and there's no indications that that would not be uh, in the final vote. But I would send a letter of support um, to that. 
So let me let me just stop right yeah. there if yeah. I could. Mr. Kamal, can we vote on that right now? The chair pen a letter to the MPO specific to the project and support. Is yes, that, thank you. Is that okay uh, within our agenda posted and everything? I think it is, but it's consensus view based on conversations with the legislative team. Yeah. Everybody good? Yes. I'll make that motion. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have a motion on the table to draft a letter and send it to the MPO specific to looking for support, continued support yep. of the downtown quarter project. And there's a second. Any discussion? Mr. Catino. No, 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 no. Mr. 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 Sorry, second. All right. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? So we'll get that letter out right away. Thank you. Uh, second question, or maybe it's just more of a comment or two. Um, so for 30 years, before I moved into the green energy space, I won't say that word, um, I worked with the T, the MBTA. And I attended, I don't know, I'm guessing, 100 meetings uh, to advance certain engineered projects within the MBTA uh, over my 30 years at Westinghouse Corporation. And I never attended a meeting at the MBTA with less than 20 people consultants, engineers, consultants to the engineers, 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 consultants, you name it. It just went round and round the merry-go-round. And these meetings would last four and five hours, and very few things would ever be decided upon. It took forever to get anything done with the MBTA. And I would, I'd be very interested in a study of the top 20 public transit systems in America and the number of employees the average salaries of the employees, et cetera, et cetera. It's just a broad study of how we stack up in Massachusetts with our public transit system basically from, you know, Worcester East versus all these other big metro areas in the country. I suspect that we know a few of the answers already to some of the questions. We have to find a way to, we have to find a way in the Commonwealth to fix that problem of actually getting things done with our public transit. I agree it's, in, in, uh, it's investments. But if those investments are made and then they're squandered, because it takes forever to get anything done, and by the time you employ the investment, it's already outdated technology, and it's not going to work, and it's not going to be serviced, because I've seen that, where they've actually purchased something, and they spent years putting it in, and then it never worked because they couldn't get it serviced because it became obsolete. I mean, it's just crazy some of the stuff that goes on. So I, I for one, of being a contractor that did a lot of business with the MBTA, get really frustrated with the inefficiency of how they run the business. You don't need 20 people in a room to make a decision about how to put a piece of switchgear into a vault underneath the green line. You don't. You need about four. But they just don't understand that concept. So. I'd encourage somebody in, in Boston to do that study and really start to figure out where the inefficiencies are because they are everywhere. And that's where we're going to improve public transit in Massachusetts, in my opinion. Okay. Just one person's opinion. Okay. But I, 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 I know, been there, done that so many times, it's really hard to get things done. Could you indulge me with one more after you speak to us? Mr. Catino. Yes, uh, and the only other one uh, we'd love some help from the legislate from our legislative branch is uh, with um, the uh, utilities here in here in town. If uh, you guys could could step in and help us with the DPU and, and when we you know, there's some there's some projects going on that we could use some interference from the uh, uh, from the state, uh, some help and some guidance. Um, because um, some of the things that are going on, I just don't want them running roughshod out over us, and we really could use some help at the top levels. Well, I, I know I speak for the senator and myself when I say whatever um, the town needs and whatever direction the town feels like it needs to go, and we are absolutely there to support in whatever way we can. Yeah. Great. Thanks so much. Okay. And both the senator and the representative have been very active in the gas gate discussion yes. Yes. on uh, Elm Street and are keenly that. aware of what's going on in terms of applications and processes uh, at the Wilson Street facility as well for Eversource. So those are two hot button issues no right now. Exactly. Yep. You yep. know that already. They're not going to go away. Uh, so just be, you know, yep. stay tuned, obviously. And, your help is much appreciated. Okay, so with that, unless anyone else has any other comments, Mr. Kamalo, sorry. Just one final comment. Um, again, I echo everything that has been said in terms of the quality of support that the town receives from its legislative team. It also needs to be said that uh, please convey 
our gratitude to your office staff. Every time we call, every time we email, <laughs> they are very responsive. We appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you. And, and well wishes to Thanks. And well wishes to the senator. Please, we'll do it. Get well, please. Thank you. Mrs. Lazarus, anything for our legislative team? No, all set. All set? Okay. Thank you so much for coming. I'm sorry, Mrs. Wright. I just want to make one, one closing comment. Um, I know we're all looking for money, and, you know, it, it all comes down to money, where we're going to get it, how much do we have to spend, and I appreciate everything you do. Um, but, for, but like some of the discussion around things like tolls and highways, there's, there's two sides to that coin. I am not in favor of trying to squeeze more and more money out of the commuters, things like the Mass Pike that was supposed to be paid four years ago. And we talk about the drop in state revenues, and, you know, there, there's rumblings even of demand-based tolling, where they're going to, you know, to think of actually trying to charge commuters more who drive during the peak commute hour. It's not their fault if they have to go to work and they have to be there at 9 a.m. Um, but when you look at lack of revenues, you know, Massachusetts is an, is an expensive state to live in. And we all know, in fact, we've lost a couple of congressional reps because our populations have dropped, partly because it's an expensive state. So, you know, what drives the revenue? Prosperity drives revenue. And sometimes instead of looking to squeeze more and more money out of the citizens to pay for these expenses, if we looked at it from the standpoint of trying to keep Massachusetts affordable for the taxpayers, you might hopefully get more revenue in the long run by becoming a more supportive state for businesses and for people to live and work in. And you get your revenue at the other end because we kept our spending in line. So I, I just want to make that statement, particularly with discussions around um, tolls and commuter rates that, um, you know, at a certain point, the, the taxpayers can't take it anymore, and, and we need to look at it from the revenue side of the people that we're representing, as well as just trying to find ways to, you know, squeeze a few more cents out. So, as with everything, there's two sides to look at. My, my closing remark for the taxpayers of the Commonwealth. Thank you. Great. Can I make a closing comment in response to the yes. closing remark? Um, <laughs> and your, your comments are, are very much appreciated, Mrs. Wright. I think what we haven't um, mentioned here today, which I think is very important, is um, workforce training. Because one of the things that I hear over and over again from employers is that they can't find the workforce that they need to expand here in Massachusetts. And, um, you know, that's something that we're very much focused on. That's one of the priorities in the legislative you see in the budget, you know, workforce training programs, making them available, matching available workforce with the jobs um, that employers need to fill, I think is a, is a tremendous opportunity for us through our community colleges, through our vocational schools. Um, so to your point about increasing the prosperity, um, you know, in, along with sort of the recognition of the, of the revenue challenges, I think is an important uh, piece of the puzzle for sure. Okay. Thank you very much for coming. Please give the Senator our best. Thank you, Dennis. Great to see you. Thank you, Representative. Thank see you. you soon. Have a good night. Mr. Kamalo, if you could do us a favor, please, and introduce item number five to the board and to uh, those watching. Uh, item number five is a discussion, and I highlight the word discussion, of the Lake Maspinock Weed Management Advisory Committee update. Uh, we want to sort of discuss where we are and where we're headed and maybe some things we have to consider going forward. Tonight will be discussion time, and I don't think we'll be making too many decisions tonight. Uh, but with that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Kamalo. Mr. Kamalo. Yeah. Through you, Mr. Chair, um, I think the, the best way to introduce this topic is to identify at least three phases uh, to the discussion regarding weed management at Lake Maspenog. Um, the first phase being the extensive discussion that occurred at a town meeting leading to uh, the setting aside of approximately $50,000 uh, under the DPW uh, um, for specifically uh, to create a comprehensive uh, weed management plan. Um, as, as part of that process, uh, the... Me, Mr. Kamal, this was a previous town meeting, correct? Not yes. Not just the recent one. Yeah, okay. uh, about two years back. 
Yeah. yeah, three years back, about three years back. Uh, as part of that process, uh, a committee was created uh, specifically to work with the DPW director in generating that plan. Uh, they were assisted by a very well-respected consultant in weed management. Then phase two was when that report came out, uh, the committee uh, um, presented uh, in a very comprehensive and thoughtful manner the results and the recommendations uh, to the Board of Selectmen in a public meeting. And I should say also that throughout the the plan development process, there were extensive meetings uh, conducted by the, commi uh, for the committee uh, working specifically with the, the abattas to the lake. And then uh, the third phase is, I believe, where we are now, uh, where there's a specific request from the committee uh, that the board address four questions. Uh, the first question being whether the board would support creating a permanent committee to oversee weed management at Lake Maspenog. Can, can you hang on one, for one sec, please? So yeah. he outlined two things that happened in the past. Everybody feel good and current and on the same page as to what happened in the past, right? Okay, so now we're sort of at the future. Or, I mean, now we're at the Present. modern day. Yes. Okay, please, go ahead. Sorry. So this is where we are now. So that's the first question for discussion tonight. Uh, the second question is for the board to clarify whether herbicides can be used in managing the weeds or controlling weeds at Lake Maspenog. And then thirdly, uh, depending on the board's discussion of item two, that a specific procedure uh, be identified. Um, number one, if the board approves, um, if the board approves the application of uh, uh, um, herbicides, that a specific procedure be agreed to in terms of how that is undertaken. And then number two, uh, in the alternative, if the board does not approve the application of herbicides what procedure would be in place to uh, control weed management without the use of, that is, without the use of herbicides. And then the next question is number four, uh, that, and, and this issue, uh, I think, was, was highlighted uh, during the presentation of the report uh, from the study, uh, namely identifying a specific window um, when the application could okay if the board decides to authorize the use of herbicides. Um, it was identified previously that uh, the success of the methods that could be used um, is dependent on seasons. So there are four questions uh, that the committee wants, would like to discuss with the board tonight. Uh, and again, I think in, in these conversations it is important to uh, understand the discussion that occurred at town meeting the extensive report that was prepared by the consultant working with the committee and presented publicly to the Board of Selectmen, which included some of the issues that are under um, review tonight, uh, and, 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 and take that into account as you deliberate on the four questions. So just to refresh my memory, um, it's my recollection that town meeting did not support the use of herbicides in the lake, is that correct? two years ago, three years ago? I think my, my recollection was that the vote was that that $60,000 be used toward um, funding a study on the use of herbicides. Uh, but there was no official vote whether to support the use or not support the use of herbicides. Okay. All right. And then you mentioned the Board of Selectmen, a prior Board of Selectmen had a meeting a year and a half after that town meeting at some point. Uh, some of us were here, some of us were not. Uh, yeah. At that meeting, can you refresh my memory then as to whether or not we supported using herbicides at that time? The board did not take any position regarding the use of herbicides. There was a specific recommendation that was outlined and discussed with the board identifying the potential, the prospects, the advantages and disadvantages of using herbicides. But we didn't take action. We didn't say yay we didn't say nay. And then following that, there was a significant drawdown of the lake 
uh, if my memory serves me correctly, two for ago. two years in a row. Is that true? No, one, one year, but two years ago. One year, two years ago. And there was dramatic improvement in that particularly following spring and summer, uh, if my memory serves me correct. And then uh, we're kind of caught up to speed with where we are today again. Is that fair? That's fair. Um, in terms of the town meeting vote, and again, I'll need to rely on uh, um, anybody else who may have the specific discussion. I thought the vote specifically at town meeting was to set aside fifty thousand dollars for weed management and the conduct uh, and and the development of this study, uh, and that that vote specifically said that fifty thousand would not be used. Um, um, uh, in, in, in applying chemicals in the lake. Right. Okay. Yeah. All right, so before we get ahead of ourselves, let's just do a quick check here. It is 8 o'clock, or two minutes till. We have until 8.15 to discuss, I'm sorry, 8.10 to discuss this matter. Then we have to move on to other matters because, again, we have to be out of here at 9.30 given some new rules that we've all agreed to. Um, there's a lot here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There's a lot of questions here. I think they're all perfectly valid questions and questions that I think need to be addressed uh, by the community as a whole and by its representatives. We are not going to get through all this tonight, right? Everybody agree with that? I mean, it's just too much to try and tackle in one sitting. Um, and for those of you that weren't here earlier, the schools require that we leave at 930 because they have uh, contractual obligations and custodians here that have that do great work that need to get that great work done and they have to be out of here by 10 o'clock and that's just the way it is so um, that's why we got really tight timeline here this evening so what I would suggest we do is try and have at least the initial discussion on item number one coming from the committee as to whether we want to create a permanent Lake Maspinock weed management committee or not we put a committee in place because we got funding from the town meeting and that committee went out and did its work and came back with some great reports and information. That was pretty much the charge of that committee at that time as constituted. So now the question is, we've got this great asset called Lake Maspinock. You know, should we have a formal longer term view and oversight process to help us keep it the way it is? Um, with that, Mr. Kamala, any thoughts on this question one anyway? terms of a Lake Maspinock Weed Management Committee, formal committee? I, I recommend to the board that uh, you consider um, mm -hmm. this request favorably. In other words, there is value in having an advisory committee uh, continue to work with the DPW um, on weed management issues at the lake. Remember, one of the things that I think came out throughout the discussion at town meeting was the importance of continuing to have a public and transparent process. And thus, having a committee in place would s facilitate that process. Um, what that might take is if the board is inclined to support a permanent committee, is that uh, you charge us with uh, drafting a charge for that committee and we'll present it to the board. Okay. So let's stay on that topic and that topic alone, if we could, please, or... We're going to do our best to try to, okay? So we're all in it together. Mr. Ted Stone. I'm going to defer for right now. I'm okay. going to let this play out. Mr. Ted Stone yields his time to Mr. Catino. Yeah, I, I think it's 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 vital that we have a, a permanent committee because, you know, as, as we just saw what just happened in the, in the past two years, we had, a, we had a choking amount of weeds, and then we had the dry down, and then we ended up having a lighter year. But as, as in some of my discussions with some of the members and also some of the people around the lake, you know, there are some spots that still could use some, some work, maybe a small shot of herbicide or something else. But to have a committee that's constantly watching this and monitoring the situation, they'll be able to, to come back and, and, and bring um, significant uh, news to us when there's, when there's something happening or if they need any help. But to, to allow them to, to work on their own for some of this stuff, I think is, is vital. Okay, Mrs. Wright. I think it's an excellent idea. Um, the committee as constituted brought us a very impressive, very thorough report in December that was extremely well presented, and it encompassed all the stakeholders that really should be brought into the process. It approached it from the scientific standpoint, from the neighborhood standpoint, from the um, you know DPW operational standpoint. 
um, that committee was able to bring a level of professionalism right. and information that frankly is beyond the pay grade of this board. Um, they, they were able to bring us informed information that we on our own, I, I think it would be hard to make the same kind of educated decisions um, or, you know, come up with the same kind of educated information that they presented. So um, I think going forward that would be a great resource to handle this professionally. Um, and I just do want to mention on the herbicides that I remember voting making a no vote at the town meeting relative to herbicides. And I don't know where that was in the context of the whole thing, but my recollection was that the town was very concerned at the time about herbicides, which is why this committee came forward with the weed management program that they did. Um, so I think we need to take that into consideration. And I thoroughly support the permanent committee to bring that same level of professionalism. Mr. Sestari. Uh, I think that, yeah, I think that having this committee is a good idea um, you know monitoring this stuff for the DPW or whomever is going to monitor it from the town side it's not like the roads where you can just see what's happening you know and the people on this committee are the people who are living on the lake they're you know they're there every day they see you know what's happening so I think it's a good idea um, you know, I would I would stress at least from my own supports standpoint, though, uh, Mr. Kamalo's uh, wording of this being an advisory committee uh, is critical to understand. Um, I have no intention, certainly, of um, you know saying that the funds for uh, weed mitigation are going to be spent under the direction of this committee. Uh, I think that that needs to be under uh, under the direction of the town. Um, you know, whether it's an employee, uh, such as the director of the DPW, or an elected board, uh, and I feel pretty strongly about that. Uh, you know, as far as the town meeting thing goes, um, I'll be the first to say my recollection could be in wrong, but, uh, uh, you know, I, I thought that we were using that money. That money was dedicated toward a study, and then we were going to use the study to determine how to move forward. Um, but when you're, when you're taking a vote, there was a lot of opposition, no question about that. <laughs> but uh, but when you're taking a vote, that vote uh, was about how the money was to be used, uh, and the money was to be used uh, uh, for the study. And so to me, that's not a yay or nay vote on herbicides themselves. Got it. Mr. Westerling, any thoughts on the committee concept? Uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, I would be lost without the committee and the expertise and the passion that they all have. Okay. We have a few other guests in the audience. I'd like to ask them kind of very specific question if they wouldn't mind answering. Mr. Barnes, Chairman of the Conservation Commission, thoughts on creating a standing weed management advisory committee? Uh, I support it, you know, for the reasons that have already been stated. And I think that, you know, when I look at this in terms of what treatment approaches may be used, it as kind of a triad approval process, um, which is what we're recommending. So it'd be through the PPW, through the Conservation Commission, and then you know, the Board of Health ultimately approving what chemicals are applied to the lake, if and when they are applied. Um, so you know, from the Conservation Commission standpoint, we certainly uh, support the forming of the uh, advisory committee and continuing that effort. Okay, let's try it from this angle. Maybe this will be a little bit more efficient. Is there anyone here this evening that's opposed to us considering drafting a charge to establish a permanent committee for the Lake Maspinock weed control process and concern? I'm not against it. I'm Ron Shane, just 36 Lake Shore Drive. I'm not against it as long as there are differing views of the committee. There's a, there's a homogeneous group here, right? And we've talked about a lot of things over the years myself doesn't seem to, it seems to fall in that here. Right? So I'd, ra I'd rather have an open and honest discussion about all the issues and address every one of those and not just nothing against our, our esteemed colleague here, with, uh, our expert, but we have to have alternative views. We have to have them on the table. They all need to be addressed. Again, chemicals are something that affect our 
children. So we're talking about the committee. We are not talking about chemicals tonight. But I mean, let's, you know, let's have different views in that committee. Okay, that's an excellent okay. point. So anybody else against or not against, but anybody else not supporting a committee? Okay, so if we were to put a committee together, the way it would work is the board, which I think I've heard everyone pretty much say, go set up the charge, bring it back to us, and we'll discuss it, we'll deliberate it, and we'll approve the charge of the committee. The charge of the committee would include establishing the number of people and the background of the people. The background of the people can be a professional background, it can be where they live in town, it can be you know their voiced views on things in the past. We can build a committee that would have differing views and differing viewpoints represented, because I think that's critical to your point. Uh, as for any committee in Hawkington to work effectively, we've got to have everybody kind of jumping in on it. So um, with that, I, Mr. Chair, I'd also like to add that um, any committee we set up is going to be subject to open uh, open meeting rules it'll and be things an of that it'll nature be an, as It'll well, be an open so. meeting law, public meeting body. Right. Absolutely. Right. Okay. Uh, so, Mr. Tedstone, anything else? Do you want to jump in at all, or are you good? No, I, I feel the same way that the, the board does as far as I, I definitely support the, the uh, putting the committee together and, and seeing where we go. Okay. All right. So, I think uh, there's clear consensus amongst your elected officials, amongst all of us, that a committee be formed in some form and fashion based on a draft we have yet to see. So, Mr. Kamalo, um, the chair will entertain a motion to direct the town manager and his team to draft a, uh, a committee charge for the Weed Management Advisory Committee, Lake Maspinock Weed Management Advisory Committee, that would be a standing advisory committee uh, to address the concerns uh, and maintain the lake as best possible, something along those lines. That's the motion the chair would entertain. So moved. Second. So we have a motion and a second on the table. Any further discussion about the motion? Hearing none. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, so while I said we won't make any decisions tonight, that one I think is pretty easy based on what everybody's saying. Okay, so there we are. We're ahead of the curve. Mr. Kamal. Um, for the board's information, I have found the actual amendment that passed at town meeting 150 to 90. Provided, however, that the Department of Public Works shall develop a comprehensive weed prevention and control plan for Lake Maspanok without the use of herbicides, and provided further that this sum is to be spent under the control of the DPW with input from a citizens' committee. Okay, so there's some more dialogue for you to have amongst staff members to figure out how we're going to put this committee together, right? Okay, so um, item two in the request before us tonight um, is to clarify if aquatic herbicides can be applied on Lake Maspinock. Baby. That's a big one. And that's not a four minute discussion. And I don't think it would be fair for us to get into that because I can feel myself cutting people off already and that's just a lousy way to run a meeting. Mrs. Wright. Can I ask a question for clarification um, you know we knew that there was a lot of feeling against herbicides in the town and in December the committee came and gave a very impressive report on what had been done I believe mr. Sonnet presented it identified the different areas of the lake that needed different treatments and the different strategies and um, I also seem to recall out of that report that they said that one of the reasons the the weeds had reached almost crisis proportions was because the situation had been allowed to go for too long without addressing and a key part would be to begin to address it and then keep on top of it and I left that meeting with the impression that with this management system that had been come up, that had been identified and with the idea that we not let it get ahead of ourselves in the future that there was an effective system that could be used that would accomplish what we needed to accomplish without herbicides being on the table. So I'm a little surprised to suddenly see this coming before us because I thought that's what the December report produced, an actionable system 
going forward. Where am I wrong? James is shaking his head over there. Yeah, I don't know if you're wrong so much as I think, you know, one of the it could be a structural issue that we have here in our town government specific to this question mm -hmm. that I think the committee that we form will address. Mm -hmm. Because while they came and gave us a report, they were, they were charged by town meeting and us at the time, go get that report and come and give it to us. And they did, and they made some recommendations. And we didn't really have to act on it because of the situation we had with weather over the last couple of years, that it kind of the pressure was off a little bit. But the fact remains, it's going to come back. They're going to come back. The weeds are going to come back. How do we want to manage it? I think if we can sort of keep the focus on getting this committee going first before we get too far down the path, because this is exactly what that committee is going to be charged with sorting out. Do you see what I'm saying? So I, I, I would rather we sort of table where we are tonight and get this committee charge figured out and get that committee populated with good volunteers that are willing to help from all walks of Hopkinton and then I think we can get into these other topics because they are very sensitive topics and uh, folks feel very strongly for, for, for different reasons. And I'd like to find a way to sort of formalize how we're going to manage not only the actual lake, but how we're going to manage the information flow and the decision making process specific to the lake. Because I think that's missing right now. Right? They made a great presentation, no question about it. Then what happened? Here we are, right? So yeah. we need to fill that. We need to fill in the gaps, and I think this process will do that. So, if I if I may, then my my perception was wrong, that despite the very good plan they set out, um, there still remained the possibility of a situation where the plan would not address it, and herbicides still needed to be on the menu. I think a lot of people would argue that point, yes, and I think a lot of people would argue that point, no. Because I thought it was not. Right, so I think it depends on your perception. Yes, Jamie. Herbicides were was just one of the tools in our toolbox right. that we decided that was applicable to specific areas within the spot. Yeah. Yeah. I remember that. It was not just, you know, the only tool that we used. Oh yeah. It was one of the tools that we thought was applicable to being used in the lake if necessary. Got it. Always on the tool. Only one. Right. It's not the one that we selected. Excellent. Good point. Thank you. Okay. So uh, I, I really do think that the best course of action right now, folks, is to we've, we made a decision in which that is to get a committee going and then we'll populate that committee and then we'll come back and revisit this some more. Okay. Make sense? Yeah. All right. So with that, we're going to wrap up this item on the agenda tonight uh, with the action item to come back soon with a charger to the committee and go from there. Mr. Gonzalez. So Uh, I can't answer that right now without getting a lot more input from Mr. Kamalo and Mr. Westerling. So I'd like to figure that out as part of our before our next meeting, exactly. get that answer. Um, I would hold tight for now, at the very least, uh, but I wouldn't say disband it until we figure out how we're going to move forward. Okay. All right. With that, we're going to move on to item number six on our agenda, which is the dog park discussion and the trail discussion. And this is specific to 192 Hayden Row and the planning process for open space and a dog park. I'll read this one out. The Board of Selectmen will discuss the request of the Parks and Recreation Commission for direction as to the location of a dog park on the property. The Board of Selectmen will discuss the request of the Open Space Preservation Commission for a coordinated planning process for property, which was acquired by the town with CPA funds and is presently under the jurisdiction of the Board of Selectmen. Future uses include open space, trails, and a dog park. Conservation restrictions will, CRs will eventually be placed on the property in accordance with statutory requirements. This action item, or this item also comes to us following this year's town meeting where there was an article specific to the dog park uh, in this area of the community. Mr. Kamal, any other introductory remarks on this? item nothing to it at this point I think you covered all the points okay so Jim, I'm sorry so, so I don't believe there was a, an article that was specific to the dark park at town meeting this year. okay 
So what am I missing, Mr. Kamal? Uh, I think, I, I think uh, the point the chair was trying to make is that there was an article at town meeting um, that related to the property, and a question did come up with regard to whether the um, the if whether the dogs will be allowed to um, to wander beyond the trail or simply be confined to the trail. I, I think that's where Mr. Hare was coming from. Yeah. So there was an affirmative vote that included that discussion. That was my understanding. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. All right. So. Um, what is the question before us then this evening, Mr. Kamala, following that town meeting discussion where the affirmative vote included that discussion that there would be a dog park as part of this trail development? I don't understand why this is on necessarily. Specifically, I think the issue is before the selectment because the property in question is under the jurisdiction of the board and my understanding is that um, the, the the Park and Rec Commission is asking the selectmen to identify a planning process for the property. And with your permission, I'll let uh, Mrs. Lazarus add. Please. Yeah, I think what it comes down to is each group is looking to identify uh, how the property can be used for open space and for a dog park and where those facilities will occur in a coordinated land way. Okay. Do you think, Mrs. Lazarus, that the discussion at town meeting would answer much of that question? I think the town meeting has appropriated funds to purchase the property for open space and has also um, approved CPA funds for a dog park. So town meeting has said both of these uses will occur there, but no one has identified where exactly those Okay. Would be. Now we're getting somewhere. Okay. Is anyone on the board have any concern or disagreement with the statement that both uses are approved for this property in question. So everybody agrees dog park is in and everybody agrees trail development is in. Correct. Okay. All right. Here we go. At the risk of opening a can of worms, does anybody in the audience have any differing opinions on whether a dog park is in or a tra and, a, and I shouldn't say or and a trail is in for the property in question. Disagree with those two being in. If you don't disagree, you don't need to say anything. Mr. Doherty. Um, nice and loud so we don't have to have you come all the way up and spend time. Jeff Doherty, open space. Uh, so I, I was on the board when we approved this going forward. But my concern is that open space has lost its ability to be involved in this process. And this is a piece of property that Open Space went after. We, we got it funded. And Open Space should be in control somewhat of any plan going forward. I'm in favor of the dog park. I'm in favor of the trail. But it sounds like to me that Open Space has been pushed aside and trails Parks and Rec and whoever else is, you know, the main proponent of the dog park has kind of taken over. Our original um, plan that we saw was to do a dog park that was a, a little bit smaller scale and that would be surrounded by a fence that was just to the right of the open area where we would have parking. And my thought is that we start small and if we have to expand it, then we go to that point. Um, but I'd really like to see open space have some uh, skin in the game. Okay. Thank you very much. Mrs. Lazarus, your thoughts on Mr. Doherty's comments? I think some of what um, Jeff's referring to is that when the deed conveyed the property to the town, it went to the Board of Selectmen. At some point, that board can delegate the custody, control, and care of that property to another board or committee as it goes forward. And we also have to put a conservation restriction on it because we did purchase it with, with open space funds. Okay. Anybody have any thoughts about Mr. Doherty's comments or concerns that open space is not active in this process at the moment? Okay. All right. So um, it seems to me the path forward 
would be for the Board of Selectmen to, uh, well, let me first back up. Parks and Rec is here. Mr. Terry is here. I saw him. There he is. Mr. Terry, nice and loud. Parks and Rec's view of the situation and a path forward from your perspective, please. So I guess a, a little bit of history just to make sure we understand because there's a couple of CPC things uh, in, in play here. Um, in 2012, the property was purchased, I, I believe, uh, I have these dates right, for, for uh, open and, I'm um, sorry, for uh, a passive and active recreation and open space. So, so it was all purposes. Yeah, and Upper, Upper Child's Trail was, was one of the potential uh, uses for it. Um, in 2014, uh, there was a discussion about getting CPC funds for this property. And uh, in May of 2015, there was $50,000 approved by CPC for the purpose of a dog park with any leftover funds to be utilized for um, the, the uh, parking lot trail potential, that, that, that type of thing. Um, in, um, so that was that was two years ago. Um, the CPC last fall, I, I, I met with them and I said, they asked for the status of the project. I said that we're working with the consultant, so that's where we are now, is we did identify a consultant because there's a large uh, grant available for this type of project. Um, and and as, we're, as we discuss this further, and as you consider what to do with the property, I'd just like to, to suggest that the grant money's not going to be available for it's a very good sized grant, and Jay Dolphy, our Parks and Rec Director, or Lori Hansen, the director of uh, the subcommittee we created for this, can, can speak to this. But there's a, there's a large grant. We're working with a grant writer that is also on the board of this group that makes decisions on where they should go. He's given us a very positive indication that, that this is a good location. Uh, we've had representatives from uh, other committees in town come to us and suggest other sites. That individual has gone and looked at other sites feels that this site on Cape Road is an ideal location. Uh, so if we don't start moving soon, we're going to put a, a very substantial amount of money in jeopardy for this project. So would it be as simple as the Board of Selectmen taking a vote since the property is under our care and whatever it's called now, um, that um, would a simple vote saying that the Board of Selectmen supports the use of this property to incorporate not only a dog park, but also a co to coordinate with the trail uh, committee, or let's fit, we'll figure that piece out in a second. But is, is that would that be the answer for tonight's question? Do you think? Is it as simple as that, or do we have to create a committee of Parks and Rec as well, or ask for Parks and Rec to join with Open Space and CPC? I mean, I'd rather not do that if we don't have to. But what do you think? It's, I mean, the, the general perception at times is that when you form committees, you delay the process. However, right. our process is to be democratic. Uh, I, we're identifying uh, needs that were um, authorized a town meeting. So town meeting has spoken to, um, to, 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 to the specific uses that need to be on the property. Uh, so that's a, that's a good starting point. Uh, and therefore, with that in mind, my recommendation to the board is that we identify a very quick process for confirming the location of the different uses on the parcel, and that will be done by a minor advisory committee to the board, since the board, board of selectmen, is uh, has jurisdiction over the property. So you're suggesting establishing a small advisory committee to it's advise the board specific to where the dog park's going to go and where the trails are going to go on that property? Yes, and I'm assuming the different entities have identified and have done it great deal of work identifying the possible locations for those uses and thus this should be a quick process okay um, any thoughts on that yeah mr. chair I guess I was gonna say that I don't think uh, um, your original suggestion I just don't think it goes far enough to really get us anywhere tonight um, you know just saying just saying that we're going to use the property for two uses um, to Mr. Kamala's point, it doesn't really set any restrictions or guidelines as to what part of the property is used for what and how much. I agree with Mr. Kamala. Maybe we can just have some type of a, an advisory group, um, you know. And if this is if this is of critical nature in terms of timing, then you know, let's say you know we need we need a recommendation by our next meeting or, or whatever we feel is uh, necessary. Um, I, 
Yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, I just think that uh, what what type of what type of funding, Mr. Terry, are we are we talking about right now? What was approved at town meeting already? So the, the other piece that was approved, so there was fifty thousand approved for the dog park at town meeting two mm -hmm. years ago. Mm -hmm. Then there was fifty thousand dollars approved for a trail at this location. Fifty-five thousand dollars approved by CTC for a trail on this property as well, and that was done with the stipulation and when when Hopkins, when uh, I think it was the trails committee came in. And with that request, they agreed that the trail should go around the dog park. That was the conversation with CPC, and that was how it was written up in, in, in the warrant article, I believe. Mm -hmm. So it, one, in my opinion, one thing has to happen first, and we need to pick which happens first. Um, and and it, it doesn't mean that there can't be cooperation, but something needs to, to happen. Right. right Otherwise, quarter of a million dollars. So did we think did we think that the two hundred excuse me did we think that the fifty thousand was enough and now we're going after two hundred and fifty I don't, I don't understand the numbers. Uh, we did think the 50 was enough. And we, we did not know. But but so so now we realize that it's not and I say we as a town well, not. <laughs> Okay. I, I didn't realize that there were professional dog park designers. An individual that left a lot of money in the trust to build dog parks in Massachusetts. Right. So, so I, I'm, I'm not even going to ask about uh, our grant writer actually being on the board that's approving the grants uh, because that sounds like a conflict to me. But uh, that's his worry or her worry, uh, not ours. But um, I, I mean, I don't know. Can we, you know, get a quick recommendation? You know, that that subcommittee, whatever you want to call it, uh, being somebody from open space, somebody from trails, and somebody from parks and rec. And I mean, hopefully, everybody can work to the same direction and come up with a recommendation. Or is there, or is there conflict even in that? I think you're going in the right direction, Mrs. Moran. Real quick, real quick, please. Engineer to advise, so we asked for the six month report. 
breathe. Then Open Space wrote to you folks asking for clarification if you would, um, if that's under your purview or if they could do that. And that's where we are now. So although there is money out there that the town has approved for trail use, it is not for the Upper Charles Trail. Please do not confuse that. That is for a stone dust trail to go around this little park or big park. I have nothing against a dog park, <laughs> large or small. I just want to make sure that if we come along in six months or a year and say the Upper Charles Trail needs to go east or west of this property, that it can be engineered in such a fashion so that we're not wasting our money. So the problem is that we're not ready. Our engineers probably won't be ready for about six months. And therein lies the conflict because the dog park committee are, are looking for their, their money. And I don't know what the answer is. Okay, so let's let's try this. A couple of points um, specific to all this discussion. Uh, one, uh, it's clear to me that we do need to quickly gather a few people that can help us make a decision, but the Board of Selectmen will make the decision. Well, the first decision I think we can make tonight is that we're going to affirm, in a minute I hope, that there's going to be a dog park on the property. Okay, so we're going to affirm that. Okay, and then we got to figure out where it's going to go, and that's where we're going to point some people to figure out where it's going to go so you can start using some of that money. That said, the Board of Selectmen, in my view, if I remember correctly, in recent months has said that the decision about where trails are going to be going in Hopkinton going forward and the path and direction which they go is back at the board level. I appreciate engineers are going to give us information. That decision will be made by the Board of Selectmen and not any other entity in town. Is that correct, Mr. Kamala? Correct. Okay. So um, with that, and given the hour and a few other things on our plate, including uh, utility discussion here in a minute. Uh, Mr. Kamal, could you make a recommendation of a three or five person group that you think should come together to site the dog park as well as the trail on this property? And then I'll come to Mrs. Peters because she's been very patient. Mr. Kamal. My, my recommendation is that uh, the advisory group include uh, the land use director and director of town operations, Elaine. Uh, representative from Park and Rec, representative from uh, Open Space, uh, representative from Upper Charles. Upper, yeah, Upper Charles Trails Committee. Did I give out to anybody? How about a rec representative of the planning board? Are they really in on this, or? Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking Elaine's participation would cover that. Okay. Who else? I want to have five. If we're going to go this way, we're going to have to have five. Yeah. Um, Anybody else? Why can't we just have three? I mean, Elaine's not. It, would Elaine be having a vote? Or? No. It's advisory. CPC. No. CPC. No. Conservation. There are wetlands. Yeah. Yeah. We want to make it yeah, so. something where we get information quickly. I think we need fewer people. And then we have to also know three. what the deadline is. Okay. Yeah, deadline. Okay. So we're having we're having an uh, we're having a a good argument made that we should have fewer not more people on this committee to make some decisions. Yeah. So, we have Mrs. Lazarus who's a non-voting member, correct? Mrs. Lazarus? Right? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. As an okay. So then we have Parks and Rec, Open Space and Upper Charles Trails Committee. How's that? I think that covers the bases by and large. It's not perfect. We don't want it perfect because then we'll never make any decisions. Mr. Terry, thoughts on that? With an affirming, an, an affirming vote tonight that we're going to have a dog park. Okay, thank you. I, I, I think you see the challenge before us tonight and we're trying to figure it out as best we can. Yes, Jay. We are definitely going to put a dog park on these properties. That's, that's, that's correct. We're going to vote that in a minute. And the purpose of this committee is to gather information to bring back to this committee, to this board. You're going to bring a recommendation back as to where the dog park should go, where the trail accompanying that or surrounding that should go. If this committee is unable to come up with a consensus on a recommendation, then we'll Mrs. Lazarus is in big trouble. <laughs> <laughs>
the designer did incorporate the trail. Okay, when we vote that the dog park is going there, those people that go on this committee are supporting the dog park that's going there or they're not going on the committee. It's as simple as that. Okay, um, I'm sorry to my colleagues and, and, going a lot uh, back yeah, and forth here. <laughs> Mr. Herr, uh, I, guess, I guess what I would expect coming from this group is not just one recommendation. I, I guess I would look for, uh, you know, a couple of options with their recommendation. Sure. And uh, at that point, we can certainly ask each member what their thoughts are on, on the individual components. Sure, but their action during the meetings that they have, which should be quick and short and yep. fast and furious, is not how am I going to stop a dog park from coming here because yeah. the right. dog park is No, coming. absolutely. Absolutely. So you good for right now? Yes. You good for right now? Good for right now. Good for right now. Just Mrs. Up. Peters, nice to see you. Nice to be here. Welcome. I have uh, several thoughts that I'd like to talk about. It's already been stated, but in fact, when we purchased this property, the single goal we had in mind was to provide a pathway for the Upper Charles to connect with the rail trail, since part of the rail trail goes through this property. The property is a 20-acre parcel. I guess before I proceed, I should say I've owned a dog for as long as I've lived in Hockington, which was 1958. I haven't had a dog in two years because I had knees replaced and my dog died and I'm not sure that I can have another dog at my age, so I have to clarify that. So the property is 20 acres and the proposal that was put forth by the consultant for a dog park has several issues. One is it takes up 13 acres of this property. That's so Mrs. Peters, I'm sorry, I gotta stop you right for a second here. The board has really affirmed, and so did town meeting, that a dog park is going to go there. And tonight, we're not going to debate the size of it. That's what this committee is going to do. We're behind schedule big time. So really, focus, please, if you could, on things to move us forward. We're not going to stop the process of a dog park. And I don't expect you to. And I support the dog park. As I said, I've always had dogs. It's perhaps the question is, where is the location of the dog, dog park? There is a historic bridge on the property, which it has been suggested that that be removed and another one built. I believe at the town meeting that the Board of Selectmen in their warrant stipulated that that bridge was not to be removed. There also is part of the Charles River on this property. There are wetland issues with this property. There is an agreement with the family for a historic plaque honoring the mother and father. And there are discussions in regard to where parking and so on goes. It's not a question of whether the bar dog park goes there. I don't think anyone has thought or opposed it. It's where the location should be. In regard to the um, engineer that is working with the dog park, he is also a member of the granting committee. The grant that is being looked at is for $250,000. <clears> I think I've been at town meetings when we haven't gotten grants that we thought we were going to get. There's also a need for more money in order to facilitate even getting that grant. There are requirements, so I think those things all need to be understood thoroughly before we move forward with this so that we're not duplicating our resources between the Trails Committee, Open Space, and the Dog Park. And I think we can sit down and settle that, but I, I have a hard time just thinking that Dog Park comes along and Dog Park says, okay, we're gonna have it here, we're gonna take this bridge out, or we're gonna put another bridge in, we don't really have to consider the wetlands. All of those things have to be considered very carefully. Mrs. Lazarus, uh, I'm assuming we're going to get this put together here in a minute or two. Uh, when you're participating in that process, if you could remember those very valid comments and concerns that Mrs. Peters raised, that would be great. The chair will entertain a motion to uh, affirm that the property at 192 Hayden Row Street in Hopkinton will uh, indeed have a dog park as part of the development process that will be undertaken by a soon to be named committee, advisory committee. So moved. Second. Is that, the, is that, is that motion clear enough, Mr. Kamalo, that we, the Board of Selectmen is advocating and stating that a dog park will go there? Yes, it is clear. 
um, respectfully, if the board's intention is to give guidance to the planning process, I think the board's vote or motion should reference the implementation of the various town meeting votes pertaining to this property, so including in, a dog park. So in the motion is the language that um, uh, um, the property will follow the direction given from town meeting uh, specific to what is to go on the property to include the dog park. Correct. Is that in the motion? Yes. In the second. It's in the second. Any discussion on the motion on the table, please? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, thank you all for getting through that piece of the puzzle. Next up, there's been a recommendation from uh, Mr. Sestari, I believe, that we put together a three-person um, uh, advisory committee specific to the property at 192 Hayden Row to um, facilitate and ensure a, uh, a coordinated development of a dog park and a trail uh, on that property. Um, that the, the committee would include three uh, representatives, one from Parks and Rec, one from the Open Space Committee, and one from the Upper Charles Trails Committee. And that committee would also have Mrs. Lazarus serve as uh, the um, uh, staff liaison, if you will. Ex officio. Ex officio. Uh, and I would encourage that Mrs. Lazarus actually chair that body so that we can make sure we get some decisions made in a timely manner. Um, so the chair will entertain a motion to establish a committee um, called the 192 Hayden Row Planning Process Committee uh, with those specific members with Mrs. Lazarus serving as ex officio and chair to manage the meeting process. Not sure if I like that name. Yeah. So moved. Yeah. So moved. Second. Okay. Yeah. So we have a motion and a second. Mr. Thank Chair. you. Mr. Kamal. Just the name of the committee. If perhaps we could identify it as a working group. Uh, okay. That's a good idea. So we're going to establish a working group. That working group will be accessible to the public at all times should the public want to participate or observe. And the working group will also notify when they're going to be holding meetings. It is subject to the open meeting law. So it's still subject yeah. to open meeting law. Then I'm good. Everybody okay? Mm -hmm. So the motion is to establish a working group as outlined. And uh, there was a second. I think, yeah, he made the motion and I made the second. So everybody's good with that. And in that motion is this group that's going to figure out this dog park and trail at 192 Hayden Row. And they're going to do it. We want to put a deadline on this thing. Yes. So the motion in the second, would you guys consider a deadline of reporting back to the Board of Selectmen on or before um, August 31st, 2017? Well, when's the grant due? Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. Laura, do you know when the... Uh, when the okay. So um, you'd like to get the grant in by the end of July? So how about that, uh, that this committee come back to the Board of Selectmen prior to its uh, July 6th. Board of Selectmen meeting? We have a meeting June 20th. But then we have a meeting in July. July. What date in July? But if they want to get this in. H hang on one sec, please. What's the date in July? Tuesday. Yeah, it's after that. So it's got to be seven days after that. Looks like the eleventh. July eleventh. So that's pretty. That, it gives you. They need. They're going to need a little time. I mean, that's, that's just two the months. Way it, is. it gives them two months. I think if we try to squeeze it into June, it's just going to be tight for okay. them. Okay. But July eleventh, and they can file by July fifteenth or so. Get their application in. That's amenable to everybody on the committee. Right. A date. So uh, have we already decided? A member that's, of the Parks and Rec yeah, that they will decide. That's for your individual a boards. Open space that they will decide. A member of the Upper Charles Trails Committee that they will decide. And Mrs. Lazarus, who will serve as the chair and run the meetings. And she okay. okay. Have to let me know who your people are. Okay. So we have a motion and a second on the table. Any further discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? 
thank you very much, folks. I know we were rushing that a little bit. My apologies. Thank but you. It was the best way to get that done. Okay. You good, Mr. Kamala? Yes, we good. Mrs. Lazarus, you good? I am. <laughs> if anyone's going to get it done, you will get it done. Okay, item number seven on the agenda is the Eversource liquefier replacement project. Uh, we're going to get an update from Eversource regarding its proposed LNG liquefier replacement project located at 52 and 55 Wilson Street. Um, Eversource plans to submit this project to the Massachusetts Department of Public Utilities for review. So we have with us this evening, as always, Joanna Leary from Eversource and her colleagues that she'll introduce in a minute. Um, so unlike our meeting a couple weeks back when we had a lot of community concern and while we have lots of concern about all the different things happening in Hopkinton, um, we have a time constraint tonight. We will not be coming to the audience tonight for feedback specific to this Eversource discussion, okay? Um, tonight's meeting just won't allow for that. Um, but uh, hopefully uh, the questions will be answered by the presentation. If they're not, you're welcome to contact Eversource directly. Joanne O'Leary is always very accessible, uh, and we'll go from here on this issue. But for tonight's purposes, it's the Eversource, it's Mr. Kamalo, Mrs. Lazarus, and the board. Joanne, welcome. Well, good evening. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Board of Selectmen. Again, it's Joanne O'Leary. I represent Eversource as the community relations representative. And joining me this evening is the Huffington LNG liquefier replacement project team. I have Mr. James Blackburn. He's with Eversource. We have two consultants with us. They're engineering consultants from CH4. We have, um, gosh, I'm just drawing a blank, Justin Smith with us, and also um, Phil Sutter. And both of them come from out of state, so they're here with us to work directly with Jim. And we know the time is limited, so Jim is going to start our presentation. Good evening. I appreciate the opportunity to present the project to the town and uh, update you on our status. So again, my name is Jim Blackburn. I represent Eversource Energy's liquefied natural gas group. I'm a project manager for the group. Just to give you a very quick introduction to the facility, if there's something I cover too quickly, please let me know and I'll go back to the slides. Uh, the facility was built in 1967, uh, provides supplemental capacity to our constrained pipelines. We serve as an emergency supply independent of interstate gas. Uh, we maintain seasonal price stability for the Eversource gas customers. That's really the main function of the facility. We're connected to over 300,000 customers in 36 towns. Uh, on a cold winter day, we make up approximately 42% of our customers' supply. The age and obsolescence of the equipment, being around almost 50 years old, um, puts the facility at risk for performance and reliability. Um, it's in our opinion that the equipment needs to be upgraded to ensure continued reliability of the facility and, rep and uh, supply that uh, needed demand for our customers. Uh, much of the equipment is no longer supported by the original equipment manufacturers. Most of the com uh, components uh, that need to be, when they need to be replaced, they need to be reverse engineered or fabricated. Um, that's a, a fairly expensive and uh, time consuming process. Um, in our mind, it's um, the time that needs to take place now in order to upgrade the facility to allow us to maintain it in that fashion. Um, our project solution. So what we're proposing to do is replace our existing 17 million standard cubic foot per day liquefier it's a cascade cycle system. Uh, essentially, it uses three refrigerants, propane, methane, and ethylene, all flammable gases. Um, our proposal is to replace that with a 21 million standard cu cubic foot per day nitrogen cycle liquefier. We'll be replacing those flammable refrigerants with nitrogen, um, a non-flammable inert uh, gas that we can store on site. We already do store it on site. It, in our mind, it's a, a much less a uh, volatile system. It provides a lot of benefits, we believe, to uh, the town and the neighboring uh, community and certainly to the facility itself. Some of the additional work that we'd be doing as part of this project is uh, replacement of the feed gas pretreatment system. That's essentially the filtering system for the natural gas coming into the facility before we turn it into a liquefied state. Uh, we'd be replacing the four existing boil-off gas compressors. Uh, we'd be replacing those with two engine uh, driven pieces of equipment and two motor driven pieces of equipment. Uh, we're doing that because we believe that the electric motors could operate those pieces of equipment probably 90% of the time. Um, 
that helps with air emissions, that helps with reducing noise and other um, benefits to the, to the facility. Modifications to the existing LNG truck unloading area, that would include grading the area, flattening that area out, allowing for better turn radiuses for trucks. Um, we would improve the security in that area, add a new scale for um, the weighing of our trucks when we take them in for inventory. Uh, we'd move the guard shack that's currently located on Wilson Street. It's a temporary guard shack that's been there for quite a few years. We'd move that off of the street. We believe that would help improve both the, the visual aesthetics of the street um, and also from our perspective, it, it's a much more secure location inside of the fence line. Um, we would be adding uh, an additional process upset flare. Um, maybe at first thought that's not an attractive um, addition to the facility, but what it really will do uh, with this new system is we have two existing flares at the facility that operate throughout the summer when we're liquefying today. In the new operation, this additional flare and the new system would essentially eliminate the need for all of our flares to operate except for upset conditions. So we would go from running a um, number of days during the summer down to hours. So for, for us, and, and we believe again, the neighbors, we, we believe that's a, another good benefit to this project. Um, this picture here represents um, both the equipment location, as you can see in the middle of that green area, um, we have an arrow pointing to the existing equipment location. It's a little tough on this to see the scale of that. We'll be replacing that equipment down to the left-hand side, which is Wilson Street runs through the center of that um, in the area of the new equipment. As you can see, the green property highlighted there is all Eversource's property. Um, there's a section that's in orange on the north and south side of our existing facility. Uh, that's owned by Kinder Morgan. And then on the right-hand side, Eversource Energy has with Legacy Farms a deeded restricted use area in which we limit the uses in that area uh, to ensure that no houses or other development takes place in that area. Um, the property to the left of the proposed new equipment is owned by Mass Massachusetts Department of Conservation and Recreation, and south of us is Wood Realty Trust. Um, we've located the equipment in that area. It's a greenfield site, so um, you know it's, a, it's currently an unused area of the property. We do feel, though, that being in that location, we uh, segregate ourselves maybe from the uh, future developments over at Legacy Farms. It allows us to replace the equipment um, without necessarily having to take the existing equipment out of service while we have a small time frame during the summer. So this will let us spread the construction season out. Uh, we won't have to mobilize a large force of uh, individuals to make that work happen. This will give us a lot more opportunity to install much better uh, equipment in a, a better, more desirable location on the property. <clears throat> the benefits of this project that we see, uh, again, uh, utilizing the nitrogen refrigerant cycle. Um, we believe it's inherently safer, it's non-flammable, it's non-toxic. Um, it'll eliminate 16,000 gallons of storage of flammables on site. We're increasing capacity from 17 and a half to 21 million standard cubic foot per day. That reduces our runtime from 200 days a year to approximately 170 days a year. That's of course assuming <coughs> the tanks were empty when we started liquefaction at the beginning of the summer. Those 30 days um, allow us to perform additional maintenance on the equipment that today, if we have any upsets, uh, we are certainly constrained on uh, being able to fill those tanks by the end of the season. We're not changing the capacity of the storage tanks. We're not changing the capacity to send out at the plant. We're not looking to increase production at the facility for any, you know, incremental gain. Air emissions um, at the facility based on the new equipment will be reduced. We're upgrading the system with current technology. Uh, we believe that this will continue the safe and reliable and maintainable operation of the facility. Relocating the liquefier equipment from the east side of Wilson Street to the west side of Wilson Street, we believe uh, will also benefit, uh, it'll reduce the amount of time the LNG flows onto Wilson Street. So currently, all through the summer, as we produce LNG, it flows onto Wilson Street to the LNG storage tanks. In the future, by having um, the equipment sited on the west side of the road, we'll eliminate that need. So essentially, we'll reduce LNG flowing onto Wilson Street by about 95%. Local concerns. So I tried to hit a couple things that probably touch closer to home for folks. Traffic. Um, disruption to traffic in the surrounding area will be limited and temporary. Our construction schedule has us about 12 months. During that time frame, we'll try to spread out the craft labor on site to limit the number and the disruption to our neighbors. Um, 
Equipment deliveries will be coordinated with the local authorities. Activities are spread out, again, to limit the number of workers and equipment on site. We're trying to minimize the traffic through the neighborhood and, and affecting the community. From a noise perspective, uh, we've taken a, a substantial amount of baseline noise uh, data in order to ensure that the new equipment will not affect, um, will not have impacts around the outside of the property line. Um, that'll be reviewed by Mass MassDEP um, and will perform mitigation functions to ensure that uh, that is not increased. During construction, uh, we'll certainly abide by the town's bylaws and limit noise during construction. Um, our contract is well aware of those requirements. From a hazards perspective, again, we're eliminating the flammable liquid stored on site. Um, the new facility will be designed in full compliance with the National Fire Protection Agency's uh, Association Standard 59A, which governs the LNG uh, production facilities in accordance with the regulatory requirements. From an environmental perspective, it's the intent of the project to strive for a net zero balance. And what I be mean by that for cut and fill is our goal is to utilize all the fill that's on site. Any, we're in, our intention is not to truck fill off site or bring fill in to perform the project. Our intention is to use what we have on site and, and, uh, and not remove a, a large portion of that. Our goal is to limit the extent of clearing. So the facility currently is sited in a manner in which the view from the street will be uh, significantly limited. Um, our intention is to maintain a very small footprint right now. We're in an area of the facility that's wooded uh, about 16 acres. Our intention is to impact about four of those acres. The existing air emissions at the facility are expected to be reduced by going by eliminating a lot of the gas-fired engines. We'll be utilizing a single gas turbine, two electric motors to replace some of those compressors. Um, in our minds, that right there will significantly reduce the air emissions produced at the facility. Um, we have no proposed permanent disturbance of wetlands at this time, and we expect that we'll be able to fully uh, stay out of the no disturb and no uh, build zone of the wetlands. We will be in the buffer zone, um, but we will not have any permanent disturbance of the wetlands. This here is a proposed plot plan. Now, this is very much in the preliminary stage, but we really don't expect there to be any major changes to this. Uh, potentially the equipment within that kind of red bounded area may shift locations within the red bounded area. The location could certainly turn 90 degrees, uh, 180 degrees to, to allow us to, to best utilize and site the equipment within that area. But, but in general, this proposed plot plan is, is you know, where we expect to finish uh, our project at. Um, you can see in blue the wetlands that we have identified on site, um, and we are well outside of the, the the areas that we need to be in order to, to you know, limit and, and, and really not disturb those at all. Um, on the right-hand side, you'll see that we've cited this in order, you know, with the ability to maintain the tree coverage of the facility. Um, so at the roadway, you won't necessarily be able to see very clearly what we have today plus with additional plantings we, we believe that that very well will tuck away nicely in the back corner of the property these are a couple of renderings of the facility again this is still in its preliminary stage but in general the majority of this equipment looks here as you'd expect it to be at the final product um, you can see in the top left corner, we have a, a larger compressor building. All of our uh, compressors and large equipment will be indoors. That'll help reduce noise. That'll mitigate a lot of that issue. Um, a, uh, the gas turbine itself is inside of an enclosure inside of the building. So we're, we're doing an awful lot to try to ensure that noise will not be a, a problem in the future. Um, a lot of our equipment has noise mitigating uh, technology built into it that'll help us uh, achieve that goal. Um, in the bottom left hand, that's hand side that shows some of the process equipment for the filtering and pretreatment system. On the right hand side you can see in both those pictures the scale of the existing tanks as compared to the future facility. Um, the existing tanks are approximately 110, 120 feet tall uh, off the ground. We in the new facility have currently no equipment above about approximately 60 foot tall. Um, the majority of our equipment is well below that. Um, we don't expect to have uh, any large pieces of equipment that you'll be able to see from a distance. 
Um, even the exist, even the new flare will be low to the ground compared to what we have today on site. That concludes the slides that I have for my presentation. Great, thank you very much. Any uh, any thoughts or questions from the board? <clears throat> Mr. Catino. Yeah, I, um, I I attended that the informational session yesterday at uh, the Congregational Church. So uh, just uh, along with um, uh, Ms. Wright, and I believe you went, you went earlier. Mm -hmm. um, and it was very informative. One of the, because for me, it was it was focusing on the safety and security parts. And, and I was just glad to see that you went over the loading of the uh, of the trucks, adding some more security there, and changing the changing the grade there. Um, one thing I was most impressed with is the uh, is the removal of the uh, 16,000 gallons of the flammables um, and go with nitrogen because uh, you know it's you know that's going with the more contemporary equipment now. Most everybody uses nitrogen when they're talking about refrigeration now, and it's glad to see that uh, that uh, we're getting more safer and safer. So uh, I was I was it was a really a great uh, informative night last night. Thank you. Um, Please, if I may, if I may sure. that the, the nitrogen cycle certainly isn't the most efficient system that we could have chosen, but it is the safest. And so that is a benefit, again, to the neighbors in the community, but also to the facility itself and those that work there. So uh, we think that was uh, the right choice to make for the project. I was pleased to see that that, that you weren't going to uh, uh, do any super clear cutting, that, that you're using the uh, natural buffers that we, that we need uh, around the facility. When we reviewed, um, to give you very, very briefly, uh, we had put this out to bid for an engineering procurement and construction project um, contract. We received four bids back. Out of those, we reviewed them for um, uh, constructability and other things, of course, design and cost. Um, one thing that we certainly took into consideration was the amount of clearing that took place. And they were this was by far the minimal impact compared to some of the other bidders, and that was important to us. We believe that the buffer that the trees and the rest of the landscape there provide is, is extremely beneficial to the, to the plant itself. So, but my only still my only concern, which I brought up last night, is that uh, crossing on, of, on Wilson Street. Absolutely, we really have to uh, stay on top of that one and, and do uh, a lot of mitigation still. We've presented this project uh, to some other groups in the town, including the planning board, and um, we've got a lot of feedback from the planning board, and, and the crossing itself is, is one item that they've brought up on several occasions, and I think we've discussed we're happy to work with the town to, to address that and further improve what we have today. I'm good, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mrs. Wright. Uh, yes, uh, thank you for your presentation, and I also attended last night's session. Um, and clearly what you're doing for in terms of upgrades, which is modernizing your equipment, making them safer, making your materials safer, um, that's all That's all a good thing. Um, so, you know, what you're presenting here sounds like a positive thing. Um, however, I do want to mention that this is being presented to the town in the, in the narrow scope of the liquefier project. But from the town standpoint, the entire Eversource LNG project um, is of import to this town. And um, I have been on both the planning board and on this board and seen all the scientific reports, all the peer studies, read all the information. Um, and we all understand that at the end of the day, the entire Hopkinton LNG operation poses some risks to the town. And they are maybe unlikely, but if they were to occur, they could be enormous. Um, I know that our planning board chairman, Mr. Weismantle, has worked tirelessly and aggressively to drive these points home with Eversource that this project and its impact to the town needs to be addressed as a whole. Um, the tanks themselves are 50-year-old, almost 50-year-old tanks. Eversource um, is taking comfort in that they are grandfathered, but those tanks should be subjected to a modern stress analysis, seismic analysis, to determine these things were not available 50 years ago when they were built, but to determine what is the safety of those tanks to the town of Hopkinton where there an earthquake 
or some other kind of event, including a terror event. And, and I'm sorry to say that in the 21st century, um, we, we are all allowed to look at the worst case scenario and not be thought of as wild-eyed, um, you know, fanatics, because that's the time we live in. Th things do occur. The pipe under the road um, is extremely vulnerable. That is short money for Eversource, whether it has 95% less gas, that 5% poses a threat to the town. Um, so far, for all the work that the planning board has tried to do, I think the only actual active mitigation that's occurred to remove or try to address any of the surrounding threats would be the installation of some gas lights along Legacy Farms property, which, if I understand correctly, it's on Roy McDowell's dime. Um, I understand from talking to the Ever Eversource folks that you feel there are other better mitigating uh, treatments should there be a vapor cloud, um, that the gas lights are not a good choice. Um, certainly ignition is never something we really want. If there are better mitigating treatments, um, we should know about them. And Eversource should be actively engaged in working with the town for the larger safety issues. We are a host community. And um, this, this operation, when it went in 50 years ago, Hopkinton was a very different town than it is today. If you were out on the prairie or you were in the Alaskan tundra, maybe it wouldn't matter. But today, it's not. You're, it's a community with residences, parks, more residents coming, um, and the risk to the town needs to be addressed in good faith. This is a large issue. And um, so I would like to see more cooperation with Eversource in going outside of the <coughs> individual liquefier issue and um, moving positively to address some of the larger safety issues for the community as a whole, which are real. May I? You may. Um, and I know you're all good guys. I'd love <laughs> every one of you to be my neighbor. Thank but you. I'm talking about Eversource right now. Um, I, I just want to. Uh, I, I just want to respond. Briefly, um, we certainly take safety uh, as a paramount focus. Uh, we continuously review our, the condition of all of our equipment. So we perform engineering analysis of the tanks, of the rest of the facility. In fact, that's what identified the replacement of the liquefier project, uh, the existing liquefier. Um, as far as the, the crossing and the protection of the piping there, I just want to point out that last summer we performed a maintenance project at the facility. We updated and replaced the existing or the prior vaporizers. At that time, while we had our contractor on site, it was after some reporting that had taken place and some, um, some information had come to us from the town. We utilized that contractor to increase the additional, uh, to increase the anti-vehicle protection around that crossing. And you can see that today. It's pretty evident. Um, so, you know, we acted upon the information that the town had, you know, fed back to us for that, and, and we did make good on that. Now, I do believe, and we've spoke to the planning board about this, that there's more that we could do there, and we're prepared to do that as part of this project. Um, and then to address, I guess, the gas lanterns, and I, I won't spend very much time on that, but we believe, and I think industry believes, that the best mitigation to any gas dispersion from a facility is really the buffer and most importantly the trees that are around the facility and so that's why you'll see in our design that we go out of our way to ensure that we maintain the tree buffer around the facility to, to ensure that we, we really maintain our, our best mitigating factor for that type of an event. So. Well, with all due respect, Mr. Blackburn, the anti-vehicle uh, items right now amount to some Jersey barriers and a pile of rocks with some weeds coming out of it. Um, the pipe is encased in a uh, chain link fence, which is totally vulnerable to whether it was some kind of a uh, weaponry or whatever. Um, for it to totally, it, sh it should be inaccessible. It, re it really should. But I'm going to let the other board members, uh, members speak. But that's one, that's one area that uh, is, is short money for Eversource that really would remove um, a vulnerability in the system. Mr. Sestari. 
Thanks a lot for the presentation. The um, 17 and a half million cubic feet to 21 million cubic feet. Could you tell me again? Now, is that processing capability or is that storage? Just processing capability, sir. Okay. Um, so, is there any plan to be storing any more? Uh, no, sir. So, um, is there any capacity to store more than you already there have? There right isn't. So, currently, we have the ability to store 3 billion cubic feet on site. Um, that's vaporized gas. Um, that liquid is 100% essentially owned by our gas customers, the NSTAR gas base. Um, that liquid cannot be sold to other parties. It cannot be used elsewhere. It's, it's only for the Eversource 300,000 plus cus customers. We have no additional customers that we're looking to add from a you know selling liquid standpoint. Um, there's no additional capacity that we're looking to add at our facilities. That is strictly for for that for our LNG our two LNG facilities, which is a cushion in Hopkinton. Okay, um, you know I think you did a great job uh, showing all the positives of this. I wouldn't expect you to show us anything else. <laughs> And I don't know enough about this to ask any real difficult questions for you. And um, I, my only comment really goes back to our meeting a couple of weeks ago about the gateway on the other side of the town. And I'll allow the chair to cut me off if he tells me it's outside the boundaries of this discussion. But I find it, um, uh, you know, a little bit insulting that we are a host community for, for this uh, plant. And an explanation of why we need a gateway on the other side of town is that the path of the distribution line coming from this plant and servicing the other side of our town actually goes north and through a couple of other towns before it comes back to Hopkinton. And as a result, as more volume is used from that distribution plant, it's the Hopkinton residents that suffer service failures first. Um, I would like to see Eversource start addressing something like that that would also alleviate a difficult discussion we're having around this this gateway issue that we have over on Elm Street. Uh, and it would better serve the people who are actually uh, hosting this plant in their own town. I can't speak to the gate station. Nope, I didn't expect I will, you to. I will make one quick comment, <laughs> though, because um, you, you did bring it up. We recognize as a company that the town of Hopkinton does not have LNG consultants on their staff. You don't have an LNG department at Town Hall. Um, so we had worked with Mr. Uh, Kamalo to ensure that the town did have some representation in that. So I, I guess I just wanted to point out that uh, Eversource Energy has um, reached an agreement um, to provide, I guess, funding for some co uh, consultant uh, review of our work. So I guess I wanted to, to put that out there I appreciate and ensure that. that the yeah. board was aware of that. You guys aren't going to give us the consultants, too. No, <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I've, I've got mine. You've got to get your own. I apologize. Yeah. I don't think we would trust yours. What's <laughs> that? Thank you. Mr. Ted Stone. So, uh, Mr. Sestari kind of hit on the points that I wanted to talk about. Your 17.5 uh, million square feet per day to 21 million square feet per day, that's an increase of 20% about. Um, so, with you expanding that 20%, um, has have you has public safety weighed in and like it, are you so you're expanding by twenty percent by these liquefiers? Yes, sir. You're not expanding any more capacity at this point. That's correct. Um, but does the the twenty percent expansion does that involve? Um, any type of permitting, any type of, does it raise any red flags with our public safety departments? Um, and so that's, that's one thing. The other thing where you, where you had said that you were going to uh, take 95% of the, the gases, I mean, the, uh, the product, so it didn't cross Wilson Street. Um, by your design of this entire thing, if if the town, because one of the, the suggestions a couple of weeks ago with that gas gate was that maybe we think about putting it back over at Wilson Street. Um, will your design of this preclude this gas gate from going there if need be? Because I understand that this project that you're doing is big and, I, and you do a lot of huge projects. I think it's, I think, I, I, I can't say the word that comes to my mind, but it's foolish, we'll say, for the scope of the, the uh, the business that you guys do and the and the projects you guys have in town, it's foolish to think that you can have that gas gate on in a residential area 
where you have all this, this area up there right now of potential to put this thing there that, that's already gas, I guess you'd call it gas related. I, I'm not an LNG, not even a moderate expert. Um, <laughs> so I don't know why we need to move things into a, a perfectly good residential area with, with uh, a, a school. And I know that's probably outside of the four corners of, of what we're talking about here. But I'm just concerned with, uh, with um, you know, obviously you sold us the, the uh, sizzle on this. On, you know, it, it's great. It's, can't, it's more efficient. It's, quiet, it's more quiet for the town. But I'd like to have someone that knows what they're talking about kind of do a point counterpoint because it's, you know, everything that you say is great that it's not going to be that tall, you're not going to um, disturb that much buffer, and it's going to be safer for the town. I'd like to have someone that knows what they're talking about say, it's true what you're saying is this, however, it could be more safe or quieter. Um, and I don't, like, I, I just don't know that much about this, but I know that a concern, and it's because of, I'm bringing it up because it's your corporation, is a big concern is this, um, this gas gate project where I think we should definitely think about putting it here if we can if we can't uh, I don't know I just it's asinine to, to think that you can put that in a neighborhood thoughts about putting it up there so um, you, you hit I guess three three points there real quick um, again we committed approximately fifty thousand dollars for a consultant to help you make those reviews and assessments Regarding the gate take station, I'm not familiar enough with that project to, to indicate why it has to be located in there. I, I will say, um, typically with those types of projects, it's having to be in an area that needs the additional demand. Uh, and so I suspect, I don't know, but I suspect that being located at this facility where we already have a gas take station, which if you look on the screen is, on, is right in here. Uh, this is our Wilson St Street take station. I suspect that locating or expanding that facility probably doesn't serve the need. I don't know enough about the project. I, I can't say that with any definitive response. And I response. think since I'm on the project team, I will take that back because our project manager does have good reasons why. I'm not saying why it should be right where you know, you're opposing, but why it needs to be on the other side of the town, and it really comes to the need of bringing gas to that area of town. Um, but we'll go back and we'll try to put it in other terms so that it's best understood why it cannot be on this particular site in Hopkinton versus on the other side of town. Yeah, so, and I appreciate that. Um, and I'm sorry to harp on the, on the Elm Street project, but for the amount of money that you spend and, and are spending, on upgrading your facilities and your products, I would, I would be very offended if you guys decided to go to the DPU and kind of try to backdoor us on this without um, kind of going through the neighborhood and and going through the process. And are you talking about this? Or are you talking about the gas gate? The gas gate. And I knew you were going to shut me off, so no, I'm, I'm trying to get. I'm, I'm with trying you. to get in as much as I can. So I'm being patient. Um, so. You know, it, it, it's, uh, I don't like the, the getting backdoored by going through the DPU where they can say, you know, you don't have to follow the town's, whatever the town says, you can do what you want. I think that's garbage with the amount of, uh, you know, with, with the amount of product that you guys have in our town. Um, you know, Parkwood Drive was available. You didn't buy it. It's probably still available. Um, but um, so... That's kind of my. Jeez, I was afraid to even allude to it for what went okay. first. Okay. Right. So, Mr. Kamal. If, Sorry. If I may, Mr. Chair, um, since uh, Mr. Tedstone is referring to permitting, uh, I would like to ask the consultants to outline the permitting process for this project. I'm sorry. I'm asking the consultants to outline the permitting process for this project. Okay. Please. You, you would like us to outline the permitting process. Okay. Um, uh, Based on who regulates the facility, which is the state of Massachusetts, specifically the Department of Public Utilities, um, this project, it's our expectation that we'll submit this at, for a zoning exemption through the, the DPU. Um, that's not a slight on the town by any means. Um, again, we have brought this early, we believe, to town stakeholders to ensure that we do get feedback from, from folks in the town to, to make sure we can kind of incorporate that design. 
that into the design. And that includes the, the crossing, the mitigation factors, and that type of thing. Um, so from, from our perspective, the expectation is that we'll have to uh, submit to the DPU through a uh, 40A zoning exemption. Uh, we also have an air permit that'll be necessary. We have an existing air permit at the facility. We'll actually be reducing that air permit through this project. Uh, but that'll have to go through the Massachusetts State Department of Environmental Protection. We are inspected and regulated by FIMSA and FERC at a federal level. Um, there's not an application process through them. However, we do notify them, notify them of the project, and, and we've done that. Uh, we have several meetings with them. Um, but, but ultimately, they're not the approver of the project. It, it stays at the state level. Um, so currently, that is our permitting process uh, uh, going forward. Okay, so um, just to wrap this up, because we do have to move on to a couple other topics. Um, the town of Hopkinton has lived with the tanks and the activity on Wilson Street for decades. And the town of Hopkinton gets it. And I think you hear that tonight, that the town of Hopkinton gets what's there. We don't understand what you're talking about, but we get the need to probably upgrade it. And not a whole heck of a lot of pushback is in the community specific to what we've all lived with for 50 or 60 years, whatever, how long it's been there. When I first moved to Hopkinton, I lived about two miles from there straight south. Uh, and I knew exactly where they were when I bought my first house. Um, built my first house, as a matter of fact. So we all get what's there. And I think the town of Hopkinton recognizes the need for energy in the region and in Massachusetts and certainly uh, you know, in New England. What we don't get is what's going on on the other side. That's not your project, but it is Eversource's project. And if we've been such a great neighbor and we've been such a great host community for decades, why this other thing is being forced down our throats, in my opinion, is flat out wrong. If we're so good to you here, and you've been good to the region here, and we've all coexisted for a long time together, why this other project is being shoved down our throats is beyond comprehension to me. I wouldn't do that to a good business partner. I wouldn't do that to a good neighbor. And Joanne, you're a great human being. Your corporation is putting us in a very difficult spot after we have cooperated for decades here. And we're going to cooperate on this thing, too. But Eversource is not cooperating with us. Shame on Eversource. And we've got to address that. That's all you're hearing about here tonight. No one's asking you about your project, guys. Okay? Eversource has got some serious problems in Hopkinton, though. And we'd hate to see it all come together into a big mess. So I implore you to please take that message and go find the solution. It's there somewhere. We haven't found it yet. And I will say the team has heard that, whether it was here at the selectmen or at the open house. And they're still, they're, they're delaying what they were going to do and file with the Department of Public Utilities. And they are going back and just looking at uh, sites to see what is available and what we can do. Okay, great. Okay, with that, uh, we do need to move on, unless there's anyone with any f other final comments. Seeing none, we will proceed. Uh, thank you for coming tonight, thank guys. Um, I'm sure there's going to be some more discussion about this and everything else going on in town as we move forward. And we look forward to working to figure out and finding that solution for the whole corporation of Eversource and the town of Hopkinton. Thank you thank very you. much for your time. Thank you all. Bye -bye. Okay, uh, item number eight. eight is board liaison reports in rapid fire succession. Mr. Ted Stone, 30 seconds. Me. Good. Good. Yeah, Mr. Upper, Charles, Upper Charles, we were put in for uh, support for the purchase of land off of Grove Street for trails and infiltration. Um, at uh, phase six and seven, looking to pass by the Conley Barn. We're looking to try and get uh, historical and CPC to take a look at that. And the really, really great one uh, for this week was the uh, Marathon Fund uh, Committee. We made our recommendations for the six scholarship, uh, six scholarships that they give out. The essays get better and better every single year. It's 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 wonderful. Uh, it's a great reflection on the schools, coaches, and the parents. Really, thank you to uh, everybody that submitted the essays because uh, it was really a tough decision, but we got the six of them out. Mrs. Wright. Nothing right now. Mr. Sestari. Nothing to report. Board invites. Uh, anything come in recently that the board should be aware of that we're not aware of to date? 
I have not seen anything myself except for the annual marathon committee celebration, Thursday, which I believe is on Thursday, May 18th at 6 o'clock at the laborers training facility on the east side of town. That goes from 6 to 9 p.m. Uh, I believe the public is welcome, and it's $30 a ticket, something along those lines. If anyone's interested, they can certainly reach out to the Marathon Committee and Dottie Fairwells. wells um, Okay. Any other invites, Mr. Kamal, that you're aware of? Yeah, the only one in the packet is the MMMA uh, HR 101 Boot Camp, Thursday, May 18th, at the Massachusetts Maritime Academy from 8.15 a.m. to 4 p.m. Will we be sending a representative from Town Hall? I was the rep at the uh, last time. Yeah. This is a this yeah. is a different oh, HR okay. focused gathering. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure. Yeah. We could look at that. Okay. Yeah. All right, uh, Mr. Kamala, Town Manager's report in two minutes, please. <laughs> oh, um. <laughs> I had two things on the agenda. The first, um, I wanted to just walk through the employee retention uh, concept plan with the board, but I realized we really don't have time for that. If we don't have time, let's not give it, uh, yeah. let's not rush that. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, the second issue was I also wanted to... Come back to, to that. Yes. Second issue, I wanted to uh, give the board the opportunity to engage uh, with us uh, and give us feedback on the last annual town meeting. We're always looking for opportunities to improve. Uh, we are really interested in hearing you directly, hearing directly from you on um, how the last annual town meeting went. I think we can do that in fairly short order. We'll start at one end and come to the other. Uh, Mr. Sestari, feedback real quick on the town meeting. I thought town meeting went well. Um, I know I was happy with it. I thought that uh, articles were presented very clearly by all the groups. I thought that the, um, I'll say major articles, but um, the, the financial articles uh, had great background behind them. I loved the uh, more comprehensive report that came from appropriations. Uh, and the only thing that I'll note to people is that with the passage of uh, what did we say, the 1%, uh, quorum being 1% of the voting population. The last couple of articles that we did address, we would have been short on a quorum. Uh, so going to the future, it's going to be uh, more critical for us to keep people in the hall, not just get them there to begin with. Um, and, uh, you know, I personally, I know that this is, this is the moderator's call, I personally would be all for having the articles drawn at random uh, so that people can't just come for an article that they're planning on okay. and know when to be there. Okay. Uh, and that way, you know, your article may come up first, it may come up last, but uh, at least people would get there and hopefully be a little more engaged. This is right. Especially with people staying home watching on TV and then jumping in the car when their article's coming up. Yeah, no, I thought it went very, very well, very, very smoothly. Um, I just want to make one comment going forward that I would like to see articles that have our name on them, that there be, could we perhaps put some kind of a public hearing process in in advance so that we get a better chance to vet those articles. Um, planning board always does that and sometimes based on the input of the board or the public they decide to either modify or pull an article and one of the articles which started out as the nuisance bylaw wound up on our plate because the planning board it didn't even get to the public hearing. They didn't even want to touch it. No one would even make a motion and it got kicked down to us, and we made some modifications, but it, that was a very, the way it started out was a loaded article, which if that had gone straight to town meeting floor without a degree of vetting, it should have had public, public comment. Um, could have really uh, been a blow up on town meeting floor, and um, could have blown back to this board. I would like to see articles that, our name is on um, be better vetted with the public before we put our name on it. Mr. Catino. Yeah, I, I was I was very pleased with how, how smoothly it went. There were, there were a few, few sticky ones, but uh, 
<coughs> considering the uh, eighty-two million dollar budget went by, went over in about uh, ten seconds. That was the that's a surprising one that people don't even uh, don't even look at the, that one. Um, but uh, yeah, to, to to Mrs. Wright's point, yeah, to have uh, to have a little more time to look at some of these things. But then then again, we were we were going to midnight those last few meetings anyway. Um, I don't know how much later we can stay, um, even in even in a temporary uh, location like right, right now. But uh, oh, so maybe uh, uh, some more comfortable seats for the uh, for the people up on the stage. Mr. Ted Stone. <laughs> yeah. uh, I thought Mr. Garabedian did a great job. This is basically his first time to run the whole town meeting, uh, so with that special meeting not included. Um, and I thought that it, it was nice um, the way that the articles from the selectmen were, were dispersed throughout the selectmen, so one person didn't have to do all the talking. Um, so I, I thought that that was a, a, a nice process. And I didn't hear a whole lot of, um, I know that one person when I walked out the first day, a very prominent person in town uh, yelled at me because we spent a lot of money. Um, and um, yeah, But other than that, I didn't get a lot of email or text saying that, that we didn't know what we were doing or anything like that. So we have prominent people in town. Uh, yeah, I thought like, they were all the, prominent. The prominent people in town are like high-powered lawyers. <laughs> yeah, I, did, I didn't know there was a high-powered I thought they were all prominent. <laughs> but um, but yeah, I, I thought that the overall, I was impressed by Mr. Garabedian and his ability to, to run the meeting, and um, I thought that we got out on time. It was that was great, and the scouts and the and and Bay Path, <laughs> awesome, awesome, <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> okay, um, I thought it went really well. It, 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 it's not a perfect process. It can be messy at times. I mean, that's democracy 101 when you look at a town meeting form of government. Uh, but, you know, all in all, I thought it was pretty efficient, and uh, uh, I enjoyed it for the most part. There were some entertaining moments. There were a few frustrating moments, but that is town meeting 101. So uh, I, I think you guys did a great job getting us ready. Um, we'd always like to have some more time on some of the articles to Mrs. Wright's point, but then we run out of time and things happen. You know, if we can formalize that a little bit differently, maybe going forward, I think that's a good idea. Uh, but we'll look at that and, and try and make some adjustments. But I think the staff did an excellent job preparing the documents. There wasn't a lot of confusion about what was typed and what was on the screen and what was in front of us, which we've had in the past. Uh, you know, we didn't have some of the sort of zany activities that have gone on before. But I'm sure in the future there will be more because it's it's a free and open process. So a uh, okay. job well done by everybody, and I appreciate everyone that came out to town meeting. And we will certainly do our best over the next fiscal year to follow the will of town meeting and get things done on behalf of the citizens. Uh, anything else, Mr. Kamala? Um, I want to take this opportunity also to thank the boards and committees that presented a town meeting. I thought they did a fabulous job. Uh, we got a lot of uh, town business accomplished and also s specifically mention the role played by all town hall staff in, in getting the warrant and the motions ready. And also, specifically, I uh, recognize Elaine's accomplishment uh, in, in that regard. She played a much more substantial role this time in, in compiling the warrant and the motions. That is why we were so organized. Yes. I think town staff, think about it. Yeah. They had to move. They couldn't figure out how to use their phone for a day. Their computer didn't work for two days. Yeah. And we still yeah. had it all there. It was awesome. It great was, paper, too. They did a great yeah. job. Yeah. They did a great job. Smoothest yeah. one in a while. Future board agenda items, Mr. Ted Stone. Yeah, I would like the board to consider the naming of the new DPW facility at a future meeting. Mr. Ted Stone would like to add to the future agenda items list uh, the naming of the new DPW facility. I second his request for that to be on the agenda soon. Mr. Ted Stone, Mr. Catino. Uh, the uh, center school, let's get back on that one. The, the committee and finish their charge and the rest of it. <clears throat> okay, Mr. Kamal. Yeah, the, the notice is out. Um, I believe we've received some applications. Some communications yes, yes. specific to me about yeah. wanting to get on that committee. Yeah, we'll, we'll so check I think we're working it, but it's yeah. not, to your point, okay. we got to yeah. pull it together. Yeah. Yep. And in fact, somebody contacted me this morning regarding that committee too. Okay, so we're on yeah. that. Great. 
Uh, anything else? I'm good. Future board agenda items. I have continued to ask for some kind of a discussion or re-examination of the renaming of a very long portion of historic Franklin Road, over two tenths of a mile. The residents whose addresses were affected were never brought into the public process. The process was very hard to follow. It seems to completely uh, contradict our policies on the renaming of assets, particularly historic resources, and um, current residents who have a legal document saying their address would remain Franklin Road have now received a notice that they are now on Legacy Farms North. Um, this, the public needs uh, the discussion that was always promised them and never happened on the renaming of this historic asset. So, have you met with the town staff specific to that question? I, I have not, but I have quite a collection of documents from residents uh, so that we're supposed I, to guarantee their address. I, I'm happy to put that on a future agenda, or the new chair can put that on the future agenda, mm -hmm. but I know that we had that on the agenda, and the board voted that in renaming. So uh, I think you should get with them first and get up to speed on exactly what happened, which was those residents you're describing were here. Well, they were over there. The mezzets were not. To us. The, mes the well, mezzets were not brought in. Okay, so, so anyway, anyway, there was a lot of discussion over several meetings specific to that very question. So there's a disconnect here somewhere with Mrs. Wright on this there issue. There is a disconnect. Yeah, so, relatively recently too, right? Sorry. R relatively recently too, within the last year. Mr. Paleko was the chair, so it was mm -hmm. last year. Um, so let's, I'm with you. Yes, because there was a selectman's vote that said, Mr. Capolico said, as long as it doesn't affect residents with an address change, and the board voted it, and a couple of weeks later they went back and redid their vote. And um, the people whose addresses have been affected um, were not brought into the process. So th this needs to be talked out because okay. there's some. I just know there was some discussion and yeah. votes were taken in the past, so let's figure that out. Yeah. Mr. Sestari. Nothing at this time. No future agenda. So if you guys could get together on Mrs. Wright's thing, please. I think that's yeah, important yeah. Um, to get clarity. And if we have to bring it back, we bring it back. Um, okay. With that, Chair will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. This is our next meeting. Our next meeting May is May 23rd, 24th, something like that. So the election is next Monday. Are we signing anything, Elaine? Uh, only you. Please get out and vote. Um, yes, please get out and vote. And we have uh, a meeting then on May 23rd, which is the Tuesday following the election, uh, and we will reorganize at that time. And Mr. Chair, could you just give a reminder next Monday is voting? Next Monday is voting day in Hopkinton. Polls are open from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m., if my memory serves me correct, uh, at the Hopkinton Middle School. 7 to 8, right? It's 7 a.m., yeah. 7 a.m. Yeah, 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. Um, on Monday, May 15th. And then we'll meet on the 23rd, reorganize, and keep going with our agendas. Okay? Sounds great. Um, with that, the chair entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? We are adjourned. Thank you. Yeah.